welcome all uh, in the e training course for preparation of icr exams like jrf srf net ars and uh, i thank mpkv rawri for giving me this opportunity i'll discuss briefly about the nitrate assimilation and the biological nitrogen fixation uh, with uh, emphasis on how their molecular aspects so uh, we will start from the beginning so how nitrogen is there in the environment it is basically part of various biochemical compounds present in our plant cell as you have already uh, studied in your degree program so basically it is part of nucleoside phosphates and amino acids these basically build the uh, entire nucleic acid and protein that govern our uh, life cycle uh so nitrogen is frequently limited in terrestrial system but is it is frequently available in atmosphere the microbial activity which converts nitrogen to lower energy forms it provides it into the uh plant system so basically the problem is that we don't have nitrogen in the our uh what we call bio geochemical cycles as solid or liquid form which can be utilized by the plant so therefore the conversion of organic form requires raising nitrogen to a higher energy levels so how nitrogen is present in the environment as you can as you know that 78% of it is available in as a gaseous form so most of it it is not available to living organism for building their nucleic acid or proteins so getting nitrogen from the atmosphere it requires breaking the strong triple bonds that is between the two nitrogen molecules to produce other forms of nitrogen that can be utilized in the nitrogen cycle like ammonia which is a reduced form and nitrate which is a oxidized form so nitrogen has to be fixed from the gaseous form that is available into the atmosphere into the some form either in reduced form or oxidized form that can be utilized by the plant and that can enter to our food chain so how this process happens in the natural environment first it can be happening by lightning uh 8% of nitrogen that is available in the atmosphere that can be converted into the different ni nitrogenous compounds like nitric acid by splitting through the lighting energy then there are photochemical reactions that can give rise to nit nitric oxide gas or nitric acid compounds then the large portion of nitrogen fixation in our environment basically happens through nitrogen fixation by the uh, microbiological entities so uh, they fix nitrogen into the reduced form that is the ammonium form so this is how the nitrogen in our environment works and that's why study of nitrogen fixation is important so as you can see there is the table where different uh, processes that is involved in biogeochemical nitrogen cycle is given and the rate at which they can be fixed okay so there are various processes like industrial fixation atmospheric fixation biological fixation plant acquisition immobilization ammonification all these processes are part of the biogeochemical nitrogen cycle okay so basically in any nutrient cycle there is two basic step one is its mineralization and the other one is its assimilation okay so assimilation in the plant system mineralization will help it to enter through the plant system so mineralization process including the ammonification your nitrification nitrosification etc and uh, when it enters into the uh, by these process into the plant system it can move out by uh, the process like denitrification nitrate leaching etc okay so these are different process which is involved and the rate at which we can fix it 
that's why the nitrogen fixation is important so once fixed in ammonium or nitrate form the nitrogen can enter now the biogeochemical cycle okay so biochemistry of nitrogen starts after it can be fixed into the ammonium form so it after fixing it into the ammonium form it passes through several organic and inorganic forms before it can return to the original molecular nitrogen by the denitrification process so the ammonium and nitrate ions that is generated via the fixation okay uh, so there is a uh, vast competition between the plants and microorganism that is living in the soil for both these fixed form for their uh, production of nucleic acid and protein for using as a substrate you can say okay so these are the basic two ions that we can utilize the living organism can utilize only two forms one is the ammonium form that can be fixed by the bacteria the other one is the nitrate form which can also be fixed by bacteria itself uh, but it is the uh, ammonium is the starting point and nitrate is the oxidized form okay so there is a fierce competition between different microorganism as well as plant for because this is a limited uh, commodity in this soil so uh, both plant also require the nitrogen and uh, the microorganism is also requiring the nitrogen so plants have developed different ways for extracting these nutrients from this soil with a faster pace because there, if there is a competition one has to win so it has to devise some strategies that can be utilized for faster extracting those nutrients so what uh, plant is doing it is uh, plant is taking nitrogen by its root okay so root uh, for there will be a formation of nutrient depletion zone in the region of the soil near the plant root so that will create a gradient which can uh, exceed the rate of uptake of nitrogen uh, and their uh, plant can win the uh, win the race for nitrogen in this soil okay so these are the basic process by which uh, plant is trying to get more nitrogen from this soil so uh, how nutrients are moving from uh, different association of, of fungi to root cells there are two kind of association one is ectotrophic mycorrhizal association the other one is vesicular arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi these are two different kind of mycorrhiza one is present at outside that's why ectotrophic mycorrhiza and other one is present in the vesicles and arbuscules of the uh, plants it creates one environment where it can uh, produce the different uh, different nutrients that can be utilized so mycorrhiza as you know mycorrhiza is the association between the fungus and higher plant roots and it facilitate the mobilization of nutrient so basically if there is a higher amount of nitrogen in the ammonium form that can be also toxic so plant can store high levels of nitrate instead of the ammonium ion and they can translocate it via phloem without any harmful effect so basic form that that is moving in the plant from one part to another it is the nitrate form so how this is created this is created by utilizing the electron transport chain and different uh, atps uh, with the help of ph change so as you can see in the figure if there is a higher ph in the stroma matrix or cytoplasm the nitri uh, nitrogen is present in the ammonium form which can be translocated into the low ph that is available into the lumen intermembrane space or the vacuole where it is because it is toxic so plant is trying to store it separately into the vacuole and if it wants to move it out so it has to be oxidized so uh, these are some examples how it can be toxic 
it is creating the methemoglobinemia where where the uh, ammonia ion is attaching with the hemoglobin and it is uh, reducing its capacity for binding with oxygen so it can also act as a carcinogenic compound so this these are basics that uh, why it is difficult for a plant to store so much ammonium or nitrate so there is a competition ammonium plant can't store because it can kill all the process like photosynthesis and they disrupt their electron transport chain and it can also harmful for the animals like humans also okay so coming to the nitrate assimilation so we have discussed the basic nitrogen cycle what process are involved what major compounds are involved in the nitrogen fixation what compounds that we can utilize we can utilize either ammonium ion or nitrate but ammonium has a problem it is toxic to the plant basic plant physiological process so that's why we need to study the nitrate assimilation which is the uh, sustainable way for plant to utilize nitrogen okay so how nitrogen assimilation happens nitrate is in the nitrate form plant moves uh, nitrogen and it can convert it into the nitrate and ammonia is uh, through the go get pathway it is uh, directly uh, converted into the amino acids so it requires large amount of energy the toxic intermediates as we have discussed is ammonium and it is required specialized enzymes that can regulate this process because if the process is not critically regulated it will create toxicity within the cell so the cell will ultimately die so what plant do plant assimilate most of the nitrate absorbed by their roots into the organic nitrogen compounds it attaches attaches the organic groups so it will be not toxic so for that plant requires a specific enzyme that we have discussed the enzyme is nitrate reductase which can convert nitrate into the nitrate form nitrate reductase is a very uh, beautiful enzyme it has three different units two different units uh, molybdenum and copper units and it is uh, attached with the heme group with the hinge region through the fad okay we will discuss this in next uh, next slide also uh, it is basically the in any protein you know the structure is n terminus region and the c terminus region the uh, junction between these two regions is the heme protein which is joining both these regions the n terminus contains the molybdenum and volt as the uh, compound and the c terminus contains the fad as the compound so here the nadph which is a energy source it is utilized and as a electron donor and the nitrate reductase of higher plants uh, the as uh, i have already discussed it is containing uh, three prosthetic groups one is fad one is heme group one is the molybdenum as a organic molecules that also called as terin okay so these are the basic groups that is involved in the nitrate reductase as a whole unit for working uh, the main component of nitrate reductase is the molybdenum okay so that is uh, basically present in the vegetative tissues of the plants the it basically works dependent of, upon the different nitrate levels what are the light intensity the concentration of carbohydrates etc uh, and it is regulated between the transcription and translation level so some factors can stimulate the uh, working of the nitrate reductase like phosphatase group okay so basically what it does it dephosphorylates 
different serine residue on the nitrate reductase, thereby activating the nitrate reductase enzyme. Okay, so you have to uh, you have to remember only these things: nitrate reductase, its subunits, and how it is regulated. The regulation is basically by phosphorylation, dephosphorylation by the phosphatase group. So coming to the next enzyme that uh, we have discussed in the nitrate assimilation from converting, uh, now we have converted uh, nitrate to nitrate. Now nitrate, uh, nitrate we have to convert into the ammonium. So for that we require nitrate reductase which converts the nitrate into the ammonium. Nitrate is also highly reactive and toxic to the plants and plant cells immediately that's why transport the nitrate generated by the reduction of nitrate in, from the cytosol into the chloroplast of leaves and plastids in the root system. So these organelles contain the nitrate reductase which converted it into the ammonium form. Okay. So basically it is also utilizing the energy where it is creating the uh, ammonia from the nitrate. So the chloroplast and root plastids, as I have discussed in the cytoplasm, it is uh, transferring into the chloroplast and in the root system in different plastid. They contains different form of enzymes, but both forms consist of a single polypeptide which contains basically iron sulfur unit, uh, which is present as a cluster of four, so that you can see in the picture Fe4S4, which takes the, which donates the uh, electron. Okay, so that's why the uh, reduction is happening. Okay, so this process requires basically light, light for the light reactions in the photosynthesis where electron is transferred to the ferrodoxin and it is converted into the uh, ferrodoxin in the oxidized form because it is donating the uh, electron to the nitrate reductase heme group. Okay, so this is the basic process. Now we have converted the nit nitrate into the up to the ammonia. So plant assimilate both nitrate in the root as well as in the suit. So in many plants, when the root receive a uh, very small amount of nitrate, the nitrate is reduced primarily in the roots only. It, can, it is not moving upwards. So as nitrate supply increases, if the little amount is present, the uh, amount is utilized itself into the root. But as the nitrate supply increases, the greater proportion of the absorbed nitrate that can be translocated to different part, like it is transported to the shoot and assimilated there for various uses. So generally, species that are native to temperate, they rely more heavily on nitrate assimilation by the roots than the species of tropical or subtropical origin because of, of the temperature difference. Okay, so coming to the last portion of the assimilation pathway. Uh, now we have converted into the ammonium. So we have to uh, use this ammonium for the protein production or amino acid synthesis. So that is called as ammonium assimilation. So plant cell normally avoid ammonium toxicity by uh, rapidly converting it into the ammonium, uh, rapidly converting it by the ammonium assimilation uh, by the combination of different enzymes. The enzymes called as glutamine synthetase and glutamate synthase. So what glutamine synthase, synthetase do? It combines ammonia with glutamate to form the glutamine. Whereas the glutamate synthase, it is stimulated by uh, elevated levels of glutamine synthase and it utilizes the glutamate. So transfer of the amino group of glutamine is uh, uh, through with a intermediate compound and it yielded two different uh, glutamate molecules. So uh, what you have to remember in uh, the ammonium assimilation, two enzymes that are required. Okay, ammonium is toxic that we have already discussed. And 
glutamine synthetase itself regulating the glutamate synthase okay so these are the basic process up to this level then uh, in the amino acid conversion the basic reaction is transamination transfer of the amine group uh, how it is done it is done by basically the aspartate amino transferases okay different amino transferases are involved uh, but the best example is aspartate amino transferase okay so once the assimilation is done into the glutamine and glutamate molecule nitrogen is already present in to the your amino acids so uh, how it is uh, transferring it is transferring by the transamination re uh, reaction how transamination will take place it requires basically transfer of the amino groups how amino groups will transfer they require the a set of enzymes that is known as amino transferases the best known enzyme is aspartate amino transferase uh, what uh, it will do it will take amino group from the glutamate and transfer it to the carboxyl atom of the aspartate so the aspartate is then going to the amino acid which shuttles reducing other uh, reducing agents from the mitochondria then chloroplast into the cytosol and in the transport of carbon from mesophyll to bundle sheets of c4 carbon fixation as you have seen in the uh, c4 cycle the first molecule is first four carbon molecule is oxaloacetic acid then there is aspartate pathway is involved where all these uh, intermediate will be there and aspartate amino transferase will uh, converting uh, different amino acids and uh, the important thing there is uh, all this process requires vitamin b6 as the cofactor as you know enzymes requires cofactor for their specific working so coming to the uh, biological nitrogen fixation uh, what we have discussed uh, up to now it is the nitrate assimilation uh, Uh, what basically we means by nitrate assimilation uh, because plant can not uh, store different intermediates of nitrate because they are toxic so they have to be somehow utilized in in the biochemistry or biochemical reactions of the plant so first nitrate has to be converted into the nitrate nitrate has has to be converted into the ammonium and ammonium has to be incorporated into the uh, your amino acid for plant utilize uh, plant utilization and uh, there are specific enzymes for their conversions the enzymes having different subunits and different cofactors which is required because these these are the high energy consuming process that's why we require specific enzymes and atp also sometimes presence of the light as in the case of nitrate reductase okay so this is the basic nitrate assimilation now we will cover the biological nitrogen fixation as uh, anywhere if biological word is involved it means there is a involvement of the living organisms the living organism that is involved here it is a bacteria basically rhizobium bacteria so the as we earlier discussed this is accounting for the most of the nitrogen that is fixed into the ammonium form uh, that is 90% and it represents the entry point of molecular nitrogen into the nitrogen cycle so uh, free living sometimes sometimes symbiotic bacteria they are responsible for converting the atmospheric nitrogen into the ammonium ion okay so most of these are free living in this soil as we know azotobacter is there and azoospirillum is there and some form symbiotic association the best known example is the rhizobium okay so prokaryote can directly provide the host plant the nitrogen symbiotic relationship is that uh, where the both the entities they are benefiting from each other okay Minute. okay so uh, the most common association as we discussed between the leguminous uh, family leguminous family and the bacteria of the genera of azorhizobium 
the root nodule, uh, as we know, in the legume plants, they are the nitrogen fixation factory overall. So that's why we are using it for the crop rotation also for, for the betterment of the uh, soil. So uh, we, now we will discuss the critical components that are required by the uh, this symbiotic relationship has to happen. So nitrogen fixation basically require anaerobic condition. Why anaerobic condition? Because bacteria are the anaerobic. Bacteria uh, produces the uh, this uh, ammonium uh, in the anaerobic uh, environment. Why? That we will discuss because of the enzymes, nitrogenous. That is a specific enzyme that works only at the anaerobic condition. So as oxygen irreversibly inactivate the nitrogen nitrogenase enzyme involved in the nitrogen fixation. This is the uh, basic enzyme that is required uh, that is required for the biological nitrogen fixation. So anywhere you hear the nitrogenase enzyme, it is basically the biological nitrogen fixation. And if nitrogenase is involved, it has to be worked into the anaerobic condition because oxygen inactivates the its activity okay so therefore each of the nitrogen fixing organisms either function under natural anaerobic condition or can create an internal anaerobic environment in the presence of oxygen so in a uh, specific bacteria like cyanobacteria this anaerobic condition is cre uh, created by creating a specialized cell uh, those are called as heterocysts. These are basically the thick walled cells which lack the photosystem. Uh, photosystem 2. Because as you know, there are two photosystems, PS1 and PS2. PS2 is the responsible for generation of oxygen. Okay, so cyanobacteria, you know, the these are the uh, photosynthetic bacteria basically. So they, they are producing the uh, oxygen but in the different compartments heterocyst are different uh, compartment created by the thick walled cells okay where nitrogenase can work and the nitrogen can be fixed so cyanobacteria can fix nitrogen under anaerobic condition and such as those that occur in the flooded fields as in the case of rice okay in Asian countries, nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria of both the heterocyst and non heterocyst types are the major means for maintaining an adequate nitrogen supply okay, in the rice field. So, uh, cyanobacteria can also work in the non heterocyst system also, but they basically work in the anaerobic condition also. Okay. So they fix nitrogen when the fields are flooded and die as the fields dry because the oxygen level will be increased in the soil. So wherever you hear the nitrogen fixation, biological nitrogen fixation, it has to be at the anaerobic condition because the enzyme that is involved, it is oxygen sensitive. Okay, so how the symbiotic nitrogen fixation uh, occurring? It is occurring at the specialized structures. Okay, so what are the specialized structures that is uh, uh, developed by plants to happening this uh, symbiotic relationship? Plant basically develops different kinds of nodules. These are also thick walled structures. So symbiotic nitrogen fixing prokaryotes, they live within the these nodules. What are the nodules? These are the specific organs of the plant host that encloses the nitrogen fixing bacteria inside them. So different grasses can also develop symbiotic relationship with nitrogen fixing organisms, but these association basically not every time lead to the formation of root nodules. So nitrogen fixing bacteria basically colonizing the plant tissues, which is anchoring the root surface around the elongation zone as you know root are divided into different zones so the root hairs were uh, present in the elongation zone that are more prone to convert into the nodular zones okay so these are also known as actinorhizal 
plants because it is uh, providing uh, the bacteria space and the rhizobium group is can be uh, dwell into these structures so you have to remember the structures where the anaerobic condition is provided by the plant it is known as the nodule okay so both legumes and actinorhizal plants they can be regulating the gas permeability in their root nodules why these structures are important because it is a thick walled structure where oxygen cannot pass so if oxygen cannot pass the nitrogenase will work and it will maintain a low level of oxygen or anaerobic condition okay within the nodule that can support the cellular respiration of the bacteria but it is uh, in the deficiency to inactivate the nitrogenase enzyme so nodule also containing a very specific uh, component that is called as lag hemoglobin it basically contains an oxygen binding heme protein okay it is a oxygen binding heme protein known as lag hemoglobin uh, the color of lag hemoglobin is the pink and it helps transport of oxygen to the aspiring symbiotic bacteria cells uh, as happening in the hemoglobin case okay in the animals so it is basically the hemoglobin of plant cells which is present into the nodules so how this symbiosis is basically happening it requires various change in the signals so legume seedlings germinate without any association to rhizobia but rhizobia will attach after the nitrogen limiting conditions appears into the legumes there what happens the plant and the bacteria seek each other support and establish the symbiotic relationship so how the signaling is starting the plant genes that are specific to nodules okay they started the signaling and those are called as nodulin genes or nod genes then there are bacteria genes which are the rhizobial genes that participates in the nodule formation and those genes also called as nodulation genes or nod genes so the nod genes are from the plant cell uh, plant side also and from the bacteria side also okay so common nod genes uh, of the rhizobial strains are nod a nod b and nod c it is found in all rhizobial strains then there are host specific nod genes those are nod p nod q nod h nod e and nod f okay so they basically those both involved in nodulation that's why they are uh, called as nod gene but there is distinction in their naming with the abc and pqhef okay so they uh, the host genes are specific for the different rhizobial species like if it is associating with uh, medicago it will be different it is associating with p it will be different so there are different host ranges the first stage of association is the migration of bacteria through the soil from the host plant okay so not factors which produced by bacteria it is the initiate initiatory signal for the symbiosis so as you know what is the constitutive expression it is the expression of any gene at each and every time point and at the organ so not d is the constitutively expressed it is having a role in the activation of all the other not genes by signaling the formation of not factors okay so basically if you study any operon there is one initiation uh, initiatory gene that activates the other signaling uh, component of the operon so not d is the that signal there the lipokaitin oligosaccharide with a chitin beta 14 linkage with the n acetyl d glucosamine okay so that act as a signal for activating the not factors so not a not b and not c encode the formation of the structure of lipokaitin molecules so this molecule will go into the plant cell and there the process will start 
so how nodule formation is happening it is also involving different phytohormones so during the nodule formation two process are happening simultaneously the first one is the infection of the root root cells or root hairs at the elongation zone and then the nodule organogenesis so as you know the organogenesis basically involves two types of enzyme either auxin or cytokine okay so two process are involved the in the first process as you can see in the diagram the rhizopia is attaching to the root hairs and releasing the knot factors which basically forming the lipokytin molecules okay so that produce a curling in the root hair after that curling in the second picture as you can see the rhizopia get caught and curl and degrading the root hair cell wall and it is entering directly into the outer surface of the plant plasma membrane then what happens the infection thread along with the site of initiation of infection it is forming and it is uh, formed from the golgi body that is depositing the material at the tip of the infection site their uh, local degradation of root hair cell walls also occurs okay as that moves so it is disrupting the uh, cell wall along the growth of the infection thread then in the next picture as you can see in the d picture the infection thread which is the end of the cell and the that thread plasma membrane fuses with the plasma membrane of root hair cells okay so then now the bacterial cells are reduced uh, released into the uh, fused cell membrane of the root hairs okay root hair cells now the rhizobia is released into the apoplast of the uh, uh, root hair zone cells and it enters into the middle lamella of different cells so this leads to the formation of new infection thread along the other channels that is open okay in the next picture what is happening the infection thread expands and it branches all along the different target cells so basically what it uh, here it is doing here different vesicles are going inside the different plant cells and those vesicles containing the different bacterial cells that are released into the cytoplasm so this is the basic basic process how the uh, nodule is formed through the signaling of uh, nod genes nod a b c as are the uh, genes that is uh, from the rhizopia side and nod p q h f e are the genes from the host side so nodule formation as we discussed in all different phytohormones so at first bacteria continue to grow the vesicles expanding by fusing with smaller vesicles okay so the vesicles is already released and if the bacteria has to grow these small small vesicles will fuse together and it will form the large vesicles okay within the zone of infection then after that uh, different chemical signals are released from uh, plant to stop uh, the bacteria to divide and differentiate okay so all this zone of infection now is inhabited by different bacteria different rhizobium bacteria and this zone of nitrogen fixing uh, bacteria is called as bacterial bacteroids and basically it is a now a organelle which is uh, fixing the nitrogen then the nodule itself develops a vascular system to exchange the fixed nitrogen by the bacteria in the exchange of nutrient from the plant so here the symbiosis is happening and because as you have seen different layers of cells are formed for thickening of the uh, zone of infection or bacterial rights so oxygen cannot move into inside the these uh, uh, nodules 
so this is the basic reaction of uh, uh, nitrogen fixation where nitrogen is uh, enzyme is present so we have discussed uh, two or three things now uh, the first one is uh, if biological nitrogen fixation has to happen it will be happening at anaerobic condition how anaerobic condition is created inside the plant cell through the infection cycles how the infection is happening that we have discussed in six steps then after those uh, steps the nodule is formed and plant sends a signal to bacteria for stop dividing inside the root hair okay so there uh, plant will establish a relationship where exchange of nitrogen as well as the nutrient between bacteria and plant is happening the overall reaction of biological nitrogen fixation is this nitrogen is reduced into the ammonium by the utilization of 16 atp so this is the question that is asked in so many enzymes earlier they were asking for fixing a single nitrogen how many atp is will be used so now they are asking how many electrons are hydrogen ions are involved so the question can be asked in both terms because atp is involved so this question is asked so many times for fixing one nitrogen you require 16 atp for confusing they are asking 8 electron or 8 h plus also so you have to remember this reaction in uh, for fixing a nit uh, single nitrogen molecules Uh, bacteria requires basically 16 atps okay uh, where these atps will uh, come we will discuss when we discuss the nitrogenous biology okay so the reduction of nitrogen basically uh, nitrogen basically producing the two ammonium molecules okay in a six electron transfer and it is coupled with two protons to evolve the hydrogen as well so the by product of this reaction is hydrogen and now comes the basic enzyme that is involved in the biological nitrogen fixation it is the enzyme complex known as nitrogenase so uh, nitrogenase uh, having two subunits one is the fe protein the another one is mo fe protein okay so if you separate both these units they are not catalytic they cannot produce any enzymatic activity but if together they are catalytic okay so as you can see the fe protein unit contains two molecules of iron whereas mo fe unit contains two molecules of iron and two molecules of molybdenum so here ferredoxin is oxidized and here the 16 atps are used to produce the two ammonium molecule with one hydrogen as by product so you have to remember only these two or three uh, two or three things one is uh, nitrogenase subunits the subunits are containing one subunit containing iron protein the another subunit containing mo fe protein it requires 16 atp for producing uh, for uh, reducing one nitrogen molecule into two ammonium molecule and hydrogen as a by products now they are asking uh, how many h plus are used or how many electrons are transferred so you can uh, the answer will be 8 electron or 8 h plus so uh, here uh, ferredoxin is also uh, reducing the iron protein Uh, how it is doing that it is binding and hydrolysis of atp to the fe protein uh, that brings the conformational chains for iron protein to facilitate the different redox reaction that is taking place by the enzyme so ferredoxin reduction is the important process in the biological nitrogen fixation for activating the nitrogenous enzyme complex the iron protein Uh, it reduces itself to the mo fe protein and the then the mo fe protein unit that is reducing the nitrogen as you can see in the figure so this is the activation 
here after activation it is basically reducing the mofe complex then mofe is reducing the nitrogen into the ammonia so mofe protein it can reduce many substrate apart from ammonia okay so these are the uh, reaction that can be catalyzed by the nitrogenase this is the simple reaction molecular nitrogen fixation nitrogen to ammonia then it can also uh, reduce the nitrogen compound like nitric nitrous oxide reduction it can also reduce the nitrate into the nitrogen in the azide reduction it can also form uh, acetylene by reducing it then it can also help in the hydrogen production as we have seen the in the biological nitrogen fixation as a by product and it also hydrolyzes the atp so mofe protein is quite capable unit for doing the different uh, chemical reactions but as we have earlier said the single unit either fe unit fe protein unit or mofe protein unit is not catalytically active so it requires the fe protein unit and mofe protein unit mofe protein unit okay uh, fe protein unit for activating the mofe protein unit for its function or for doing the biological nitrogen fixation so in summary what we have discussed the assimilation is the process by which nutrient acquired by the plants are incorporated into the different carbon constituents necessary for growth and development here we are discussing the nitrogen so the constituents that are necessary for growth and development are the proteins that we basically required and nitrogen has to be incorporated into the nucleic acid also as purine and pyrimidine so for nitrogen assimilation is a series of steps which constitute the nitrogen cycle the principal source of nitrogen available to plants are nitrate as well as ammonia the nitrate absorbed by roots is assimilated in either shoots or roots depending upon the species and in nitrate assimilation first nitrate is reduced to the nitrite then nitrite uh, moves from cytosol with different enzymes that is known as nitrate reductase now nitrate reductase function converted into the nitrate then nitrate is reduced into the ammonium in the root cell in the lower quantity when it is present by the nitrate reductase then ammonium has to be incorporated into different uh, amino acids okay in the process of nitrate assimilation uh, where it is converted by the uh, glutamine synthase and glutamine synthetase okay so then glutamine synthetase as we discussed it is regulating the other enzyme glutamate synthase okay how it is trans is uh, how it is uh, entering into the front amino acid by the transamination how transamination is happening by the transamino uh, transamino phase enzymes okay the basic enzyme is aspartate trans amino transferase okay then biological nitrogen fixation uh, biological is uh, related with the biological in entity the symbiotic relationship between okay so uh, what we were discussing we were discussing as the host specificity so if there is a host specific interaction then the correct signal will go correct uh, luteolin or the flavonoids will go and plant root hair will curl and it will allow for the infection if the uh, wrong flavonoid or incorrect signal will go the plant uh, the plant root hair will not curl and the infection process will be not completed so how this specificity is controlled there is a specific modification to the not factor structures that we have already discussed they recognize different r groups different not factors recognize different r groups that uh, from that 
they are changing the host range for example s meliloti it is having not h p and q with the addition of sulfate for reducing end of the not factor molecule whereas the mutants of the not h fail to nodulate the alpha alpha but gain the capacity to nodulate which so in this example if we mute basically different nodes are inducing different host for the pro production of uh, nodules in the uh, medicago okay the s meliloti species is uh, producing different not factors like not hpq which is adding the sulfate group for reducing the end of the not factor if we mutate one of the not factors like we mutated the not h it will fail to nodulate the alpha alpha because we have mutated this gene so the sulfate reduction capacity is also gone so there will be no nodule formulation so not factor will not work with the medicago but with the mutation it is gaining some different modification capacity that's why it is nodulating another plant that is which similarly in rhizobium leguminosorum that is the uh, common rhizobia which is infecting the leguminous crop nod x is adding the acetate group to the non reducing end and restricting the host range only to the p genotype because it is carrying the sim2 factor okay so this is how the specificity is controlled it is controlled by the different modification of the not factors different r groups are modified differently some are reducing with the sulfate group or some are creating the non reducing in by addition of the acetate group okay this thing we have already discussed how it is attaching then the after recognition root hair curling is happening then localized cell wall degradation will help the bacteria to move forward then the infection thread will form the cortical cell will be starting to differentiate then rhizobia released into the cytoplasm then the bacteria right differentiate and by the induction of nodulins it will spread along with the root hair forming the rhizoid so there are different host gene expression for the nodulation and nitrogen fixation so these factors called as nodulins these are the plant proteins that is synthesized directly with the response of the infection of the bacteria nitrogen fixing bacteria for the nodule formulation so these are classified as early nodulins and late node late nodulins so the early nodulins are expressed before the beginning of nitrogen fixation whereas late nodulins expressed just before or during the nitrogen fixation so what is the work of early nodulins it is starts the root hair curling then formation of infection thread and in the nodule morphogenesis morphogenesis whereas late nodulins govern the different metabolic activities during the nitrogen fixation so these are from the plant side from the bacteria side we have already discussed there is nod gene nif gene and fix gene fix gene is those genes which are not present in the homologous form in the klebsiella which operon we have studied so this is the example of early nodulins it is found in the medicago sativa glycine max and pisum sativa don't need to remember all these things just uh, you can look at different kinds of the uh, early nodulins are and they are classified as uh, in glycine max they are e nod in uh, pisum sativa they are e nod ps e nod then in medicago sativa they are ms e nod okay so early nodulins classified as e not so if in some exams they ask what is e not so you can recognize it is a early nodulin that is plant proteins produced for the uh, event early no nodulation event okay so now coming to late nodulins late nodulins work as forming for the leg hemoglobin as in the case of pisum sativa the uh, gene is involved ps not 6 
then glutamine synthase gsn1 uricase then sucrose synthase then phosphoenol pyruvate carboxylase then xanthine dehydrogenase then nodulins in peribacteroid membrane for example ngm24 these are uh, uh, more important uh, because in some exams they are directly asked question from this uh, what is ps06 okay ps06 is encoding the leg hemoglobins then gsn1 so they uh, uh, give different gene name and they ask whether these are involved in the nitrogen fixation or not so you have to remember like not 6 gsn1 or e nod 1 then suc3 it is involved in sucrose synthase but it is basically governing the is the symbiotic relationship okay this part we have already covered but this is the pictorial representation only how the nod box is activated nod d is the primary gene it activates the nod box where nod factors will be recognized here plant is producing flavonoids that is recognized by the nod d nod d interaction happens nod d activates nod box nod factors will go they will start forming the root hair and with the uh, induction of this operon nod abc nod other nod factor genes will be started to express okay so then nod factors will come they will start the process of nodulation and after the nodulation happens then the relationship will be established between the rhizobia and the plant so biological nitrogen fixation we already discussed it required 16 atp okay then it produces two ammonium molecules then uh, these are some details uh, that you don't need to understand just remember that uh, sometimes it is asked that 117 gram of carbohydrate used to fix one gram of nitrogen okay so this much energy or this much food has to be utilized for fixing only one gram of nitrogen so it is a very high energy consuming reaction and just remember that nitrogenase is sensitive for oxygen so it has to be happen at the anaerobic condition because it is the uh, oxygen is damaging irreversibly the nitrogenase enzymes catalytic capabilities nitrogenase we discussed it is having two subunits one is iron sulfur one is uh, mo fe unit okay so uh, the iron sulfur called as dinitrogenase reductase whereas molybdenum iron sulfur called as dinitrogenase nitrogenase reductase is sensitive to oxygen okay so the one component is sensitive to oxygen then we discussed already the process is starts with the reduction of the uh, uh, first subunit that is dinitrogenase reductase which is consisting of iron sulfur unit okay after this process happen it will reduce the femo unit and it will ultimately reduce the nitrogen molecules into the ammonium molecule by utilizing the 16 atp this is the basic process from the photosynthesis the ferredoxin is getting reduced and it is reducing in turn the fe protein complex the first unit uh, then the second unit will be reduced by uh, the fe protein unit and this mo fe protein unit is the most capable unit which is reducing the nitrogen into the ammonium form so these are different genes of the nif pathway the nif operon and they function differently so as a molecular biology student you have to remember some of these genes they are directly been asked in exams uh, there uh, but you can remember the uh, different genes like nif h it is responsible for nitrogenase reductase uh, fe protein unit then nif d it is nitrogenase femo protein alpha unit part nif k is uh, the part of beta subunit uh, these enzymes related with the femo unit 
and they are forming different tetramers. Then NIF A is the regulator of NIF transcription factor. NIF L is the negative regulator of NIF transcription factor, and so on and so forth. These different genes are there. You can click this picture also. Uh, these are the important genes. They have been asked in different exams. Okay, so you have to remember this. Now uh, coming nitrogenase enzyme complex we already discussed. So the whatever the subunits are there, they are responsible for synthesizing different parts. Like H is responsible for Fe protein subunit. Then D is responsible for alpha. K is responsible for beta. Or whatever we have discussed. Okay, and the important thing that. Uh, repetitively asked which are the regulator uh, genes in the uh, this pathway so those are a and l which works as the regulator of nitrogenase enzyme complex so you just remember the l and a other if you can remember that is good uh, others important are the hdk only h is uh, responsible for the first subunit tnk responsible for the second subunit uh, Synthesis. Okay, this just you remember now. L and A is the regulator. H, D, and K is response. H is for the uh, first subunit, FES subunit. Then D and K is responsible for MOFE protein uh, synthesis, alpha and beta group. Okay, this is basically what this figure is also describing. H is uh, H is translating uh, into the First subunit that is Fe protein subunit, then D and K is translating into the FEMO protein, then A and L responsible for the regulation. This is the pathway. Then there is one RNA polymerase which is activating the NIF A gene, which is responsible for the these are all NIF genes, no? They regulate the nitrogen fixation pathway. Then the ferroduction is uh, responsible for the electron transport. Then the ATP will uh, reduce the Fe protein subunit. Then Fe protein subunit reduce the FeMO protein subunit. Then the electrons will donate it to nitrogen and it, it will reduce into the ammonium form. So you get this now. You have to just remember first the nitrogenous subunit has to form. It will be formed from the different genes. Those are HDK. H is for the first subunit, Fe protein subunit. D and K for the second subunit. The regulation of uh, this operon or this pathway is happened by A and L gene. The activation of uh, NIFA by the NTRC RNA polymerase. After this activation, the electron transport will happen the ferrodoxin will be activated. The, this ferrodoxin will reducing the Fe protein unit, then FeMO protein subunit that will donate its electron to the nitrogen and it will form the ammonia. So this is the basic summary uh, that we have already discussed. Uh, some more genes, those are involved uh, that you have to uh, remember. So for nitrogenase, NIF J is uh, initially donating the carbon, which is activating the NIF F. Then the NIF H and uh, H, as we discussed, is forming the uh, FES subunit, which is reducing by utilizing the ATP. Then D and K is forming the second subunit, which is reducing the nitrogen into the ammonium form. Okay, so NIF J is the start. NIF F is the next one. We have already discussed the regulator A and L. NIF A and L is the regulator. NTRC RNA polymerase will activate the NIF A. Then the whole process starts from the reduction. First reduction of the first subunit, then that uh, subunit will reduce the uh, next subunit and it will reduce the nitrogen ultimately into the ammonium form. These are the examples you will find in any book. So I 
I have told you the important ones which you have to remember for the regulation for the nitrogenous subunit and for the initiation. As you can see, the J and F is the initially involved for the nitrogenous two function. Okay, so these you don't need to remember. They are different clusters of uh, these uh, NIF and FIX genes. Okay, so. You can remember the uh, names like Rhizobium meliloti, it is involved in nitrogen fixation. Brady Rhizobium japonicum, it is involved in nitrogen fixation. Then Azorhizobium colinodens. These all responsible for nitrogen fixation. Their arrangement of NIF and FIX genes may differ according to the species and according to the recognition sites. Okay, so you don't need to remember that. The basic clef CLA one we have already discussed that you remember A L H T K. Okay, then the J and F. These genes you have to remember. Uh, this is the example of symbiotic plasmid from Rhizobium Italy, but you don't need to mug it uh, up. You can see different fixation, nodulation, and NRC genes are there for this plasmid to work inside the plant. No need to remember all this. So why this is significant? Uh, it is significant to determine the function and interaction of genes involved in nitrogen fixation and changing the gene products and for facilitating the manipulation of nitrogen fixers to produce different improved strain for use of inoculants on the crop plants. Okay, so I hope nitrogen fixation you have understand some bit. Uh, I have not prepared, uh, got time to prepare about the calorimetry, but I have uh, prepared something for chromatography. So we'll discuss the chromatography in brief. It is a lab, lab technique for separation of mixture and it consists of two words chroma as you already know the chroma is color and graphene is to write so based on the color if we separate different bands different compounds if they separate according to different colors so that that process known as chromatography so in the chromatography colored bands will appear and they separate the individual compounds and it is used for measuring or analyzing the different compounds like it is qualitative also and quantitative also so purpose of chromatography either we have to analyze something determine chemical composition of a sample or preparative also it can be used to purify sufficient quantity of a substance in the advanced chromatography technique like hplc and others we use to uh, purify sufficient quantities okay so uh, basically it is started with this sweat experiment where uh, the tall glass open column uh, that is filled with sand like particles and uh, we have used the uh, grinded uh, plant extract and poured it through the column and different color bands will be appeared as the uh, the mixture is per percolated through the sand like particles and different compounds are separated based upon the color. So it is the separation based upon the color. So there are different terms that we can discuss. The one is the chromatograph. Uh, it is basically equipment that enables the sophisticated separation after the chromatography. So for example, uh, it is used in gas chromatography which we usually call the GC or LC. You have heard that term LC, MS, then GC. All these terms comes from the chromatography. So uh, the other term that is eluent. The eluent is the fluid which is entering the fluid as in the example in this wet experiment, we are using the plant extract. So that fluid which is entering through the column or the solvent that carries the analyte. It is carrying the analyte, which we want to study. Okay, so that uh, liquid known as, that fluid known as eluent. The eluent is the mobile phase that is leaving the column. If we uh, pour some plant extract, 
something will be retained into the column and other thing will be move out so the move out part is the move out part is known as eluate whether as the uh, part the whole part that is entering into the column known as eluent uh, then there is a stationary phase that is also known as immobilized phase in the example it is uh, the sand particles okay so immobilization can uh, be done in the different support particles or on the inner wall of the column tubing and there are examples like if we use silica layer uh, particles uh, in a paper so that will be a thin layer chromatography okay the mobile phase is moving in a definite direction it can either be liquid in the liquid chromatography or either can be gas in the gas chromatography so the mobile phase moves through the column that is the stationary phase where the sample interacting with the stationary phase and ultimately will be separated then what is the retention time the time take takes for a particular analyte to pass through the system okay so if you pour some plant extract there is a certain time at which the analyte will uh, retained in the systems okay under the uh, that can be detected at particular set of conditions okay after the passing through the column so that time is known as the retention time then what is sample sample is whatever substance which we want to analyze okay then solvent any substance that is capable of solubilizing the other uh, substance okay these are the basic terms so chromatogram is the visual output that is attached with the machine then separation after we separate different bands based upon their affinity so different peaks or patterns will appear uh, for different components of the mixture so as you can see in this example if we want to separate two different compounds one is the triangle one is the rectangle and as denoted by different colors so they will be retained at different uh, different length of the uh, column and uh, their signal will come after different time okay so based upon their affinity to the column they are separated at different time as you can see in the figure okay so whenever the uh, so uh, elute is separated or the analyte is separated which we want to detect so we will have a peak in the chromatogram so chromatogram will look like this there will be no peak no peak no peak and wherever the solute is there so one peak will be appear then there will be no peak then if the second solute is there the second peak will appear so this is the basic example how any chromatogram will look so as you can see in this picture this is the uh, real chromatogram so as you can see in the x axis you can see the retention time the time uh, taken for a elute to pass through the, the column and this is the signal point so this is the signal for one compound this is the signal for another compound so here it is not separated yet here those both molecules are separated so we can analyze by the chromatography this and there are different types of chromatography based upon the solvent phase solute etc so they are liquid chromatography gas chromatography thin layer chromatography paper chromatography and they are used for different application like testing water samples then detecting different kind of things in the airports then detecting pesticide insecticide residue we use thin layer chromatography and most commonly that you have used in your biochemistry uh, practicals those are the tlc uh, those are the paper chromatograms they separate the amino acids and ions and other things okay sorry i could not prepare well for the chromatography part and uh, the calorimetry part 
if we have time we can discuss it sometime later okay so if you have any questions please ask हेलो 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 यस सर हाँ जी किसी को कोई क्वेश्चन है तो पूछ सकते हैं श्योर sure, सर चैट बॉक्स में भी आप लोग लिख सकते हो क्वेश्चन ना अगर आपको पूछना है तो हेलो सर यस सर हेलो आई एम ऑडिबल हाँ सर आई एम ऑडिबल ओके ओके फॉर फ्रॉम पार्टिसिपेंट एनी डाउट if no so then uh, we can conclude i think uh, if you have any queries so you can ask so can you share ppt so sir will share the ppt later but if you have any problem or uh, doubts uh, on this topic so you can discuss later so i will provide uh, email id to you so okay sir yes, yes. thank you for uh, delivering such nice lecture and uh, hello yes sir yes sir <laughs> and actually uh, sir it is very short, short, with, short notice <laughs> yes <sir. laughs> yes uh, you, uh, in short notice you accepted our invitation that is very important sir <laughs> so within hours <laughs> so you accepted our invitation yes, and sir. deliver such nice lecture sir definitely this lecture is helpful for uh, uh, participant in future also sir and we are ex expected uh, this uh, type of the co coordination and cooperation from uh, future also sir okay sir sure sir yes 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 sir and uh, on behalf of uh, post graduate institute mahatma phule krishi vidyapeeth rahuri we are very much thankful to you sir for the uh, delivering such nice lecture thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir yes sir thank you uh participant don't leave the meeting please so next lecture uh, we will start within a uh, minute हेलो डॉक्टर सौरभ सर
dear participant please uh, uh, don't leave the meeting meeting will start within minute sir uh, dr sashi kumara will join the meeting and this is last lecture of today's uh, e training program so don't leave the meeting sir i have joined the meeting you are joined meeting yes sir yes sir, yes, sir. good afternoon oh, good, good afternoon, afternoon sir good afternoon sir yes yes welcome welcome sir welcome okay <laughs> One minute, sir. uh shall we start sir ah no problem sir start uh just a minute sir so good afternoon to all of you uh so this is the last lecture of this uh, e training uh, online e training program uh so we have with us again young and dynamic personality dr sashi kumara scientist uh, genetic uh, uh, genetics and plant breeding Uh, division of crop improvement uh, grassland and fodder research institute jhasi sir has completed his uh, graduation from us bangalore in 2013 he has completed master degree in genetics and plant breeding from us bangalore in 2015 uh, he has completed his uh, phd in 2019 in genetics and plant breeding from the iira iira new delhi so uh, he has professional experience as a scientist uh from uh, iri narm in uh, 2000 uh, 3rd uh, january 2019 up to 4th uh, april 2019 as a scientist and currently he is working as scientist icr igfri in uh, from 15th april 2019 he has received so many award and recognition so he has secured first rank in agriculture research service examination in 2015 within the discipline of uh, genetics and plant breeding he has received best poster presentation award in list uh, in first international uh, symposium on uh, cereal for food security and climate resilience held uh, online during january 2022 karnal so he has published so many national and international paper research paper in peer reviewed and uh, high nas rate, rate, rated journals so he has a uh, vast experience in his uh, field so with this word i kindly request to dr sashi sir please uh, deliver the lecture on said topic please sir okay thank you thank you for your kind words sir you, you have i have disabled uh, screen sharing one one minute one minute sir i will make you co host one minute sir huh? yes uh, yes okay sir now you are co host so you can share your slide please okay sir thank you okay whether my slides are visible hello it's yes yes it's visible sir okay no issue so Please. then i i will continue so yes, yes. good evening everybody 
so uh, i am dr shashi kumar p uh, so working as scientist from icri jfri so the topic given me to present today on quantitative and biometrical genetics so it is uh, one of the tough and uh, largest uh, part uh, of the component in genetics and plant breeding so which i try to cover uh, which are the important things in a, uh, in a very simple manner so within the specified time so this topic is very important uh, in terms of especially for the ars because most of the questions will come from from breeding and also from quantitative and biometrical genetics so hope so this will be benefit to the the students so far so now uh, let us come to what is uh, why uh, what is this quantitative genetics the quantitative genetics is nothing but it will uh, deal with the traits which are uh, quantitatively inherited so means the traits which are uh, controlled by many genes many genes so initially when the when the mendel discovered uh, uh, this uh, principles of inheritance so he only took uh, discontinuous traits or qualitative traits so which which can easily distinguishable so soon while later so even mendel also uh, deliberately avoided some uh, other traits which are continuously inherited because the, he could not apply statistical principles to prove the uh, theory of inheritance so when the slowly uh, the people came to notice that most of the characters which are continuously inherited the people were confused so so then the many theories has been proposed and they have proved that the traits most of the traits all the economic traits what we use in the plants or in the animals all are controlled by uh, quantitative uh, quantitative genes or nothing but the many genes so these quantitative traits are controlled by many genes many major or major genes and they have they show continuous variations means some will be, uh, it will show continuous variation as a normal curve as shown in the picture so now so when there was there was a dispute uh, between this continuous uh, variation and also the mendelian uh, mendelian community and also these people who were looking to these quantitative genetics so then some experiments has proved these quantitative genetics uh, these quantitative traits uh, means these uh, traits also controlled by genes and they show all Men mendelian inheritance but they are controlled by many genes and also affected by environment Uh, environment in that one experiment is nielsen l uh, experiment where he uh, conducted an experiment on kernel coat color in wheat where he identified two extreme color in the wheat one is uh, purple and white so when he crossed the f1 was uh, optimum that is in the red color and then the he selected it he got he got different continuous variation in the color from purple to, he could distinguish these lines uh, the uh, progeny into different uh, cl classes so like purple dark red red dark red light red something like that so then he put a thought that so these are controlled by two genes like not from not like single genes this trait this trait is controlled by two genes where the genes will act in additive manner so if the four genes four alleles of a genes are present so then there will be a purple color if three genes are there three alleles are there Uh, three genes are there then it will be dark red color then two red color light red so it means so you could classify this based on this gene uh, uh, genes uh, by taking into consideration of many genes so this is one which shown that uh, yes the these quantitative traits also show mendelian inheritance and they are controlled by many genes so consequently the yeast who carried the um, uh, experiment and he applied statistical principles uh, taking into the fl flower length of uh, uh, nicotiana longiflora or tobacco plant where it took parents with a long flower that is 93.3 mm and a parent uh, another parent with small flower small length fl flower length that is 45 mm so then he got he generated f1 the mean of the generated is same as the mean of the parents and the self in the f2 you could get many classes many classes from very uh, around 50 to so very different classes of the uh, different flower length in millimeter and the variance is high but the indicating the presence of uh, means in the f2 generation as in the mendelian uh, uh, mendelian experiment the parents the f1 was uniform and f2 was segregating it was it was showing more variation same thing in the f2 population here also showing more variance more vari variance so but the mean 
the mean is similar to f1 and also the f1 mean is similar to parental mean so then he proved that these quantitative traits are controlled by many genes and they are affected by the environment so then so when such difficulties there where they, these are controlled by many genes they're tracing them and affected by environment or what is their useful in the plant breeding see you see so all the economic traits are controlled by quant uh, quantitative traits so because of this genes uh, quantitative traits you could see the inbreeding depression and that process which is not possible in case of qualitative traits the whatever the amount of variation you see uh, in the plant uh, system you, you take any crop for the matter if there is a qualitative trait suppose for the yield it is cut by single gene then you will get you will have only two types of or two to three types of variations where you could not do any you cannot apply any breeding methods because these traits are controlled by many genes and they are responsive uh, they are also affected by environment you could the uh, breeders can create much of variation by through crossing and uh, and through recombinations and they could select desirable plants which is uh, which are having different combinations of the genes which are controlled the uh, yield or some other traits so for selfing uh, in, in cross pollinated plants they are uh, highly susceptible to inbreeding they, they show inbreeding depression means the vigor will reduce as the selfing increases this decreasing the vigor is called inbreeding depression and when we cross those two inbreeds the heterosis we get the f1 hybrid which will be superior to parents so this this mainly because of quantitative traits and the dominance may, uh, dom because of quantitative traits and secondly correlated response to selection if you select for one trait then if the another trait which is related, correlated with these uh, traits also will be selected along with uh, the selection for trait uh, which is desirable then resembling between the litigies so when there is a Sips, siblings are de developed when you sell it or when you cross it and the progeny is developed there will be resemblance between the relatives so this is the, mainly because possible because of quantitative uh, genes traits and they are highly responsive to environment so that if a plant if a variety which is highly responsive to some uh, for a drought it can perform very well in the drought environment so you can release that variety to a particular environment and you can get more benefit compared to other other varieties so such a uh, thing is also there and you know uh, and this is one of the traits which is controlled by many major large number of minor genes and these quantitative genes show transitive segregants so these are the transitive segregants which are targeted targeted highly in the self pollinated crop in the varietal development so when you cross two parents or average parents and you get in the f2 you will get the parents which surpass the p1 and p2 so such plants are called transitive segregants so this these all things can possible because of quantitative traits so then so, so whether i am audible can anyone tell me whether i am audible or not hello yes you are audible okay so this, shall i continue thank you so now so once uh, so this quanti when the traits are controlled by many genes so it is very difficult to trace them so then the people thought applying to the in the population level because in the genotypic level so some may have four uh, four genes some other will have different combinations of genes so so you cannot distinguish in a single plant level so for that when the people thought applying the statistical principles like mean variance frequency such sort of things and they develop different concepts in population in the population level so in that one of the main uh, principle is rd uh, main uh, principle is rd weinberg equilibrium this is this is given by rd weinberg it states that allelic and gene pre, uh, genotype frequency in the population will remain constant from generation of generation in the absence of any evolutionary uh, influences which means in the absence of selection mutation or assortative mating or uh, for, for some inbreeding uh, such sort of thing i mean there is no disturbance for the population if and the population size is large and which is random mating and it is not affected by any other selection pressures on our uh, which uh, are the event like mutation or migration which change the gene frequency of that population the population uh, genotype frequency gene frequency will remains generation after generation same it means suppose if you have a if you consider one gene with two alleles capital a a the frequency of that is p square this is heterozygotes will have pq pq that is 2pq and another is recessive that is q square 
the through generation after generation the population frequency will remain p square plus 2 genetic frequency will remain p square 2 p square plus q square unless if you don't disturb this so this is very much applicable in in case of plant breeding where in in the development of open pollinated varieties in the cross pollinated varieties so what you will do with open pollinated variety or the heterogeneous population where you will maintain in the isolation condition if you maintain them in the large population in the isolation condition then there will be random mating will uh, occur their equilibrium will remains if one random mating is enough so the equilibrium will be attained so then year after year if you want to produce seeds of growth uh, of that variety you should grow in the isolation you just go for random mating uh, without where you should not allow any migration or not uh, natural selection so then that variety seed, seed can be produced year after year can be supplied to farmers so this concept is taken is very well suited in case of maintaining and seed production of open pollinated varieties so this is uh, one of the uh, ordinary creeping where this is allelic frequency this is genetic frequency the heterozygotes the uh, the more, most of the heterozygotes will be frequency of heterozygotes will be greater where the allelic frequency p and q will be 0.5 once the allelic frequency of particular allele increases then the frequency of the homozygotes for that allele will increase so if for a a allele if the allelic frequency is increasing here it will reaches to point nine there then the homozygotes will be higher for capital a in the similar in case of recessive allele if the allelic frequency increases then the homozygotes for recessive allele will keep on increase in the population so now we come to phenotype see so we know that so uh, quantitative traits controlled by many things and these are affected by environment so we know that phenotype is a total output of genotype and plus environment influence so for the simple reason in order to derive whether that uh, genes are controlled uh, have showing validity effect or dominance effect or which is affected by environment we consider a genotype where Uh, this is will reduce the uh, trait of trait so that is uh, a to a to that is recessive allele so and we have given the value minus a so this is a1 a1 homozygote so it will add to the value so that is called plus a so this is the mean point mean point between these two the deviation from the mean point is the heterozygote the heterozygote how much deviate from the mean of these two you know, parents is called d that is, uh, d value suppose take it for the example this is For a one, a one capital a one, which is giving fourteen grams of uh, seed yield. So this is heterozygous. It is showing twelve grams. This is recessive homozygous. It is showing six grams. Now, if you add this whole uh, uh, capital a one, a one uh, homozygous plus recessive homozygous, so it will add to twenty gram. So if you divide by two, you will get mean. So mean is ten gram. Then your heterozygous is deviating from the mean is. It is showing twelve grams. Means the difference between the mean. To the heterozygote is two gram, so this is because uh, two gram. So then it means that the capital A one will add two gram to the trait. Means for a for a plant for a plant it will average yield will be ten gram. So if you have if the plant if you introduce this A one allele, then the the grain weight will increase by two grams. So then if means capital A one A one is there four gram has been increased, that is it becomes fourteen gram. Similarly. If the recessive allele of that gene is available, A two, it will reduce the grain yield by my two gram means from ten, so minus two gram will be reduced. So again, this is homozygous condition. Then four four gram will be reduced. That's why the capital uh, the recessive A A two A two, which is which is which will reduce the trait value. The capital uh, sorry A one A one will increase the uh, trait value. So that's why this is oh, fourteen gram means it will reduce the trait value by two gram. This will increase the trait value by two uh, two gram. So, so this is uh, this is simplest model where we can uh, derive uh, the expression of quantitative genes. So for that, so once you know the value of the uh, gene, uh, genotype, so and if you know, this is the value, this is plus a, this uh, the, the frequency in the population. See population. This suppose you have this a one a one is there. A to A to A one A two zero two P Q Q square. Their value is plus a. This is a deviation that is D additive value, and this is minus a. So when you uh, multiply, uh, when you the product of frequency of the uh, genotype and their value will give the population mean of a particular uh, population. 
so that uh, propagation we have, if you add that uh, this p square a to p q d so it will come to a into p minus p plus 2p 2d p q so this is most of the times it is asked in the objectives and also uh, this ars examinations so now come to average effect in the case of as you know the genotype will always transfer the alleles to the progeny genes to the progeny not itself genotype so the any progeny which is formed will be combination of different uh, genes which is received from the parents so for that reason if you want to identify the what type of progeny will be there then you have to have a average effect of particular gene so this average effect of a particular gene is is the mean deviation of the gene from the population mean of the individual received that gene from one parent the gene received from other parent having common uh, at random from the population suppose in a population you select one plant one 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 line which is receive one gene from p1 and another allele of that gene from randomly from the population so then the deviation of that de uh, gene from the population mean is called average effect means we will calculate average effect for all type of genes pre uh, present in individuals so then this average effect will be used to derive the breeding value what is breeding value it is mean value of the always breeding value is highly used in especially in the animal genetics so same way so parental value what uh, we will derive from the progeny we project we looking into the progeny we will decide the parental value so then we will select such parent from the crossing program or development of you know, cultivars the so similarly what is breeding value breeding value is if an individual mated to a number of individual taken at a random from the population then the breeding value is a twice the mean deviation of the progeny from the population so breeding value of a parent is its uh, is uh, breeding value of a parent is a total average effect of the gene present in the parent which will be passed to the progeny so if it pass positive genes from parent to the progeny then the progeny the superior progeny will be produced so this is the concept so then the total genotypic value is is equal to breeding value almost always we say breeding value is controlled by average effect that is additive uh, effect of the gene so that is breeding uh, genotypic value is equal to breeding value plus dominance uh, deviations so domination de dominance deviation is, is equal to uh, genet uh, difference between the genotypic value and the breeding value so since these are controlled by many genes and affected by environment so we cannot trace single gene like a mendelian experiment so then they have given different concept to identify whether the traits are controlled by adaptive gene or dominant gene or epistatic genes so then the variance the variance total phenotypic variance of a genotype is equal to the variance due to genotype plus variance due to environment so this will this variance due to genotype is maybe due to it includes additive variance dominance variance and in uh, interacting interaction between that is epistatic variance and environmental variance so what is additive variance it is the component of genotypic variance which result due to average effects of the gene so this is this is the variance of breeding value so if the if the plant has more ad additive variance means the breeding value is high it it will uh, it will produce superior in uh, a progeny and you can select that plant uh, and the from the progeny segregating progeny you can select the plant and it will be effective so it, this is main reason for the um, um, resemblance between the relatives and it is fixable the additive variance we always say it is fixable means if you continue selecting the gene the dominance variance what will uh, happen the dominant genes will segregate so in the next generation you cannot get same effect but if you keep on selecting this additive variance the homozygous as the homozygous zygosity increases the additive, additive variance will get fixed in the homozygous condition so what is dominance variance this is the deviation of heterozygous from average of the both the homozygous that is f1 the deviation of f1 from both the homozygous is called dominance variance and it is mostly associated with heterozygosity it is not fixable because you cannot fix dominance variance in case of in the in such in homozygous conditions it always seen in the hybrids then selection is not effective you cannot select hybrid uh, for further generation it will segregate and the dominance variance will uh, spread out and you will get most of the recessive rec combinations so as the selfing increases the dominance variance will deplete as the, uh, as the inbreeding progresses the additive variance will in, uh, will be fixed then the epistatic variance this means the genetic variance result due to uh, interaction between the two genes 
so this may be additive and non additive component means if there is interaction between additive and additive genes or maybe additive and dominant genes and dominant into dominant genes so these are always there in lowest magnitude in in generally in most of the crops additive variance will be maximum the dominance there will be in the optimum optimum in the optimum uh, magnitude and in epistatic variance will be lowest magnitude so this is the difference between additive variance and dominance variance this is higher magnitude in the natural population this will be moderate this is associated with homogeneity this with heterozygosity and selection is effective if there is additive variance is there for a trait of interest you can select the trait and you can fix in the homogeneous condition and you can or use use that parent for crossing program to develop the cultivar but dominance variance is non effective and this this because of this additive variance you can get expect to get transcriptive segregants which is not possible these are fixable these are not fixable here you used to when the additive variance is more for a trait of interest you go for development of homogeneous cultivars but when there is a dominance variance is more you go for development of hybrids so this is more uh, this will be found more magnitude higher magnitude in self pollinated crops In the this is in the cross pollinated crops. So this is transcriptive segregant. What is transcriptive segregant? <laughs> the extinct phenotypes are transcriptive phenotypes observed in segregating hybrid population. That is in the EPTO population. In order to get the segregating uh, transcriptive segregant, the parent should be to the mean mean of the population. See here, this is P1, this is P2. It is having different uh, dominant genes. This is having some in the uh, another type of dominant genes. In the EPTO condition, what will happen? You will get a complete homozygous plants with all dominant genes, and another complete homozygous condition with all the recessive genes. So these are called transcriptive segregants. This is possible because of uh, quantitative uh, traits. So for getting transcriptive segregants, the first thing is trait should be trait should be controlled by quantitative, that is um, uh, controlled by many genes, and second thing, parent should be uh, in the optimum to so the mean should have parent should not be extinct. Parent should be uh, average, average, average uh, trait value. So then you can expect to get a transcriptive segregants which can surpass the parental values. Okay. One second. Now comes to heritability. So heritability is very important in the breeding program. The trait which is having high, high, uh, higher heritability will be a response to selection. the trait can be transferred to uh, generation through uh, generation over the generation so heritability is the proportion of observed variation in the progeny that is inherited or it can simply a ratio of genotypic variance to the phenotypic variance how we will estimate the heritability so first thing is through analysis of variance in the analysis of variance you will partition you will party uh, you will divide the total variance into genotypic variance and error variance so the, when you minus the, uh, the error variance from the phenotypic variance you will get the genotypic variance the genotypic variance divided by total phenotypic variance you will get the heritability and uh, or from the second thing is from the estimating genotypic variance and error variance from parents uh, from the p1 p2 f1 f2 you select two parents you cross it you get f1 and you uh, get f2 since the f2 are segregating generation you cannot get heritability as if for the f2 so for that what you have to do you grow uh, p1 and p2 and f1 along with f2 generation so then since this f1 p1 p2 are complete this p1 p2 are completely homozygous f1 is completely heterozygous any variation observed in case of parents and the f1 is due to error variance or environmental variance if you minus this error variance in the total phenotypic variance of the f2 population for a trait of interest you will get a genotypic variance so from that using that genotypic variance we can estimate the heritability or from the parent offspring regression so when you use single one parent as a common so then the twice the regression of parent to the offspring will give the heritability so heritability is classified into two types broad sense heritability and narrow sense heritability in the broad sense heritability it is total genotypic variance to the phenotypic variance whereas in the uh, narrow sense heritability you will calculate a ratio for the additive variance to the total phenotypic variance and this is uh, the express the extent to which phenotype is determined by genotype here uh, it is uh, it is majorly due to uh, additive variance means narrow sense heritability is very important because 
this is the very ends which are fixable and it will respond to selection if nascent heritability of a line in any segregating generation for a trait is high means you can expect very good progeny from that uh, from that uh, from that line so that is uh, that is why this is nascent uh, heritability is more so this is major in case of pure lines and inbred lines this is will be estimated in, in case of segregating population so heritability is uh, really useful in case for uh, determining whether the trait is useful in this breeding program and uh, to see whether if the heritability is low what will be the most effective selection strategy if i then what what selection program should be applied so these things can be used because of true heritability so now come to genetic advance it is the improvement in the performance of selected lines over the original population it means suppose this is a original population you can see here you are selecting some lines from this and you grow this progeny what is the improvement in the selected progeny uh, selected progeny over this original population is the genetic advance so this will measure the genetic gain under selection so it is the genetic advance is dependent on selection differential and also heritability of the character so and also the intensity the selection intensity what is the selection intensity it is the amount of selection applied it means if suppose this is the whole population is there in that 10% of population you are selecting means your selection intensity is 10% the higher the proportion of population selected lower the intensity of the selection if you want to increase the intensity of the selection then you have to decrease the proportion means if you reduce by if you select 5% of the population means your selection intensity is high so the genetic advance is depending on intensity phenotypic standardization and heritability of the trait so here selection intensity it is a percentage of population which retain through selection the differential is the difference between the mean of the selected plant to the original unselected population the difference between this portion which is selected between the whole mean of this population is the uh, selection differential and response to selection is nothing but the improvement of inherited potential of the uh, population through selection it is the difference between the mean of the progeny selected plants which measures to selection as c what it means you selected some plants from here then then you grow the progeny and you identify their mean value it is the progeny of the selected plants to the original population this is selected uh, this is original population and this is the new population developed uh, developed from the selected plants the difference between these two is called response to selection so now come to inbreeding heterosis so this is very important concept uh, in case of uh, quantitative uh, genetics where the inbreeding is nothing but the, if you continue to sell the population so then the inbreeding will increases so this the main effect of inbreeding is homozygosity since the homozygosity uh, of recessive alleles will keep on increasing the their trait value will keep on decreasing they show depression in the trait value so this is called inbreeding depression and degree of inbreeding is uh, in any generation is degree of homozygosity in the in that particular generation and the degree of inbreeding of individual is expressed as uh, inbreeding coefficient f lines almost uh, homozygous due to continuous inbreeding are maintained through close inbreeding known as inbred lines and inbreeding depression that i have already uh, explained to you it is loss of vigor or the fertility due to continuous inbreeding so now heterosis when you cross the two parents the f1 will be superior over the parental lines or the check relative that is called heterosis that is depend as the superiority of the f1 hybrid over the both the parents in terms of yield or some other characters so this is called heterosis this is one of the heterosis is one of the concepts which is highly used in the plant breeding and earning crores of the rupees in the companies and yet it is still not completely known why the heterosis occurring in the breeding program is still not completely known their mo its molecular basis not completely known we have theories which we are showing but still much of the uh, complete information regarding heterosis is not known but it is highly exploited in breeding for for the for earning uh, and it is contributing much to the economy of this uh, world so here there are different types of heterosis one is average heterosis or relative heterosis that is difference between f1 
with the uh, mid parent value so this is average atrocis if you compare the f1 with the better parent the parent used to develop atro uh, f1 hybrid that is uh, superior parent that is called atrobiotosis and this is some um, atrocis uh, which we need to use when you want to develop a cultivar or hybrid that is useful atrocis that is best commercial variety you take the difference between the f1 with the commercial variety may most of the time you should use when you want to compare a hybrid you should use always another hybrid so if, if at all hybrid is not there then you can go for any uh, open pollinated variety the difference between commercial variety and the f1 will gives the economic atrocis or useful atrocis this is highly used when you want to release the hybrids to the uh, for, for cultivation so now come to biometrical genetic explanation for atrocis so mather and zing given uh, this um, uh, their concept for the atrocis there is a one formula it is called when there is a dominant gene is more than the additive additive genes in the pop, in the population is used the atrocis so for that in the faulkner book there is a formula atrocis is equal to d y square this is very very important where d is magnitude of directional dominance and y is the square of or y is equal to magnitude of difference in the gene frequency it means the heterosis which see in the f1 is majorly due to the dominant uh, gene action and the difference in the gene frequency if uh, if you the two p1 and p2 you cross you get f1 so f1 you are showing heterosis it mainly because the atrocis mainly occurring because of the dominant genes present between the um, dominant genes which are there in the f which are uh, uh, which are there in the f1 and the difference between the gene frequency between the two parental lines it, it gives the atrocis so if all the genes are show directional dominance the atrocis will be maximum when the all the genes show directional dominance and uh, and these dominant alleles will disperse between the parents means there should not be fixing of the alleles like all the dominant alleles will be there in the p1 and all recessive alleles in the p2 so then you will not get maximum atrocis the maximum atrocis will get when the genes are dispersed between the two parental lines if r that is y so if rd is one that is all the dominant alleles means all the dominant alleles are present in one parent while recessive are present in another parent in such condition you don't get maximum atrocis the where you will get maximum atrocis at rd the difference in the magnitude of gene frequency between the two parents is zero that is both the parents contain equal number of different dominant alleles affecting the traits so if the both the alleles in gene uh, parents will have dispersion of genes uh, dominant alleles so then the atrocis will be maximum so this is this concept is called uh, this formula is called h is equal to dy square so now come to so combining ability so combining ability which is what is so once uh, uh, it is uh, known that the atrocis occurring mainly because of uh, this uh, quantitative traits and mainly because of dominant genes and people was uh, confusing how to compare this uh, this uh, how to get this um, ability of this inbred life see when you are to get superior hybrids you start continuously developing inbred lines So you continuously self inbred lines, uh, self the lines, and you will get set of inbreds, and you go for crossing, and you will get atrocis. But not necessarily all the inbred lines will lead to superior uh, hybrids. But see, in every uh, every generations, the breeder need to develop more than hundred, five hundred, six hundred, thousands of inbred lines, and now and if you want to evaluate uh, cross between those inbred lines, you should do. Uh, if you want to do crossing. Then you have to do hundred means hundred minus one. It will be very huge, huge number of crosses. You should match flowering time, everything. This is very difficult. So then, the concept they have started uh, started is combining ability means while generating the inbred line, they calculate the combining ability of of uh, the uh, line development that is in the S one, S two or S three generation. and they will start rejecting many of the lines in the s2 or s3 generation that is initial selection or after inbred development they go for combining ability analysis and they select 
which are the inbreeds which are superior it can yield uh, very uh, heterotic hybrid that is uh, superior hybrids so from those inbreeds only they will go for uh, developing uh, hybrid so how so what is combining ability let us see after inbreed dying is developed it is crossed with another inbreeds or uh, and its productive in single double cross combination is evaluated the ability of inbreed to transmit its desirable performance to its hybrid progeny is called, referred as combining ability means the inbreed when it, it is crossed with another inbreed its ability to transmit its desirable performance to the hybrid progeny is called combining ability so this combining ability uh, is estimated through test cross means for that you do some crosses you select some parents and you do some crosses between these inbreeds from analyzing them uh, analyzing those you get a value that is you get the combining ability test cross is a cross between the plant or line and a tester that is common parent used in the test cross it may be inbred hybrid synthetic open punctured variety so based on the your need you select the uh, tester so in the combining ability there are two types general combining ability and specific combining ability general combining ability is the average performance of a strain in series of cross combination estimated from the performance of f1 of the crosses okay so it means what suppose you take a 10 inbred 10 inbreds and you cross with a five tester so you will get a 50 you develop a 50 crosses here average performance of a strain, uh, strain in a series of cross combination p1 parent is crossed with 10 another uh, p1 Uh, male is crossed with 10 female, uh, 10 female line the p1 uh, strain performance in all the 10 female lines is called general combining ability means the mean of the opposite opposite family of the particular parent and, it, and its deviation from the whole mean of the cross uh, crosses which we are conducted is called general combining ability specific combining ability is deviation in the performance of cross combination from that predicted on the basis of general combining general combining abilities of the parents involved in the cross specific combining ability is the particular cross how superior than the crosses among the different crosses attempted so that is called specific combining ability if a single parent which which perform well in the many crosses then that is called general combining ability means p1 is crossed with 10 10 females and it is producing very good uh, performance in the in cross between all the females means the p1 uh, general combining ability is very superior so it can be used as a best combiner and it can deliver best um, hybrid it can transmit its desirable performance to hybrid progeny in uh, different cross combinations what is fp means the particular p1 into p2 if f1 is superior over the all the population means means that is specific combining ability means that line will have the p1 p2 are specific for that cross the combining ability the superiority you are getting in the f1 of two cross uh, two parents is specific for that cross so that is called specific combining ability uh, gca is a characteristics of parents and the fpa is a char- cross uh, characteristics of crosses or hybrids so as i said the gca is the main effect this is interaction effect because the fpa is derived from the particular cross gca is for particular parent when it the parent which perform well in cross between different female lines so then that is that line is having higher gca if the particular cross is performing well compared to other crosses then the line will have higher uh, the p1 p2 the f1 is a higher fpa so this total the, the mean of the p1 cross between p1 p2 the mean of the f1 is the de- is deviation from whole crosses of all crosses if you perform 50 crosses of cro- mean cross of parent p1 p2 is mainly dependent on general combining ability of the p general combining ability of the uh, parent q and their specific combining ability so this is the whole concept so from this concept the state the breeder will use this combining ability analysis in the initial line development uh, or in the inbreeding process and they will call out the non performing or unproductive inbreeds in the initial generation itself that is early generation selection and in the when the inbreeds are developed so they also go for these uh, crossing with testers and they identify different lines which are having high gca and high ac and they go for hybrid development so now comes another concept called correlation 
the correlation is a it is a simple uh, uh, another statistical analysis which is used uh, in the plant breeding so it is used to measure the degree and the direction association between two or more variables means whether the two variables which are using are correlated and the direction whether they are positively correlated or negatively correlated if the two traits are positively correlated means selection for one trait will also in, uh, if you select for i yielding trait means another trait also will keep on increasing so it is like that means it's a simple way the grain number in the wheat condition the uh, higher the grain number you will get higher the yield if you select a line for higher grain number the yield will increase means yield and also grain number are highly correlated so if the this is the condition so if negatively correlated means some trait will have negative effect on the trait of interest for example canopy temperature so canopy temperature is a trait which is used in the uh, drought uh, selection breeding program higher the uh, canopy temperature means the plant uh, efficiency uh, plant water use efficiency is low so if you select a plant for lower canopy temperature then the plant water use efficiency is, uh, is high then the plant will have high drought tolerance that is negatively related so uh, that means the canopy temperature is negatively related with grain yield under drought condition so if you want to select higher grain yield plant under drought condition then you should have a plant uh, you should select the plants which are lower canopy temperature so this is the correlation this correlation is is, uh, is expect, uh, estimated through co correlation between x and y is equal to covariance of x and y divided by square root of variance of x and variance of y will give the correlation value this always correlation will be from minus 1 to 1 now plus 1 higher the values towards the plus 1 means higher the correlation then higher the value towards the minus 1 means uh, that is higher negative correlation so here towards the plus one means for more positive correlation so if you want to have a functional relationship between the two traits then you go for regression between the two traits if you estimate the regression coefficient so you can estimate if some degree of change in one trait will uh, how much degree of change will be affecting in the another trait suppose if we increase grain number by number of 10 then how much weight the grain yield will be increased that is how much gram of grain will be increased so that is estimated through regression between the two traits and if you want to go for whether the this correlation is because of direct correlation or through indirect correlation then you go for path analysis where in the path analysis you will apply, you will use this correlation data and you will develop a path data, path table where you will i uh, you will get the data you will see that if the trait is having high higher positive values higher higher value so then you, where you can divide the traits into direct and indirect selection if the directly correlated so direct selection for trait x will have a higher value in the grain yield if they are indirectly related means you should identify a trait suppose z trait which is indirectly related to x so that you can select z trait so that uh, if you select z trait then the x will increase then the grain yield will increase if they are z and x are in, uh, z, x and y are indirectly related then if you directly select x even though they are correlated will not give much of a, a productive uh, improve, uh, improvement so for that condition we go for path Hello, I am audible. Hello. Hello. You are audible, sir. Okay, okay. Here power gone. So that's why. <laughs> okay, now I connected with the mobile mode. Hello, I'm audible.
हेलो आई एम ऑडिबल यस सर ओके शशि कुमार सर इज देर एनी प्रॉब्लम सर अनम्यूट युअर सेल्फ अनम्यूट युअर सेल्फ सर ओके सॉरी सो नो प्रॉब्लम नो प्रॉब्लम actually here power gone so that's why internet got little disconnected okay now again i can uh, connected to inter, uh, internet so now shall i continue yes yes sir yes sir oh, okay thank you so this is correlated response to selections your slide is uh, not visible sir please share your slide sir okay we will do it again yes sir it's okay. visible thank you sir thank you please continue sir so so response to selection uh, is nothing but if you select one trait so the other trait which is related in the pathway of developing the that trait will also uh, have some response either it may be positive or negative suppose so in such, in such condition see if you want to select for drought plant, sorry dwarf type of plant so then you will have a lo lower coleoptile length in the plant see in the dwarf weeds are very famous no all the cultivars are uh, for dwarf types so in such conditions if you select for dwarf type so you will have a uh, shorter co coleoptile length so this is uh, it is uh, when you select for dwarf type of plant it is correlated response to that selections so they are related in the pathway so that's why if you respond for one trait then you may have another type of response what will happen when you have a shorter coleoptile length so then the 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 germination you should go for uh, less depth of sowing and those plants will be less drought tolerant because uh, so if higher coleoptile length the plants will have uh, higher tolerance so higher tolerance that is also negative impact uh, but Uh, it is it is have a negative impact in the grain yield but in case of drought tolerance it will be more uh, more it is uh, more uh, uh, promisable so such is uh, such response is called correlated response so the correlated response to selection is mainly dependent on intensity of selection and heritability of the traits and correlation between the traits so so that's why so means if you want to see uh, calculate the correlated response to a selection majorly depends on the intensity of the selection the intensity of selection you applied for the x trait and their uh, heritability of the uh, trait x and also trait y and their correlation between the trait x and y and their phenotypic uh, phenotypic variance of y so this all uh, will put together will lead to uh, different correlated responses so now comes to estimation of gene action so gene action is measured in terms of component of genetic variance or combining ability variance and effects so majorly so when the traits are uh, controlled by uh, quantitative tra uh, quantitative traits so it controlled by many genes so then there are the genotype is majorly dependent uh, the genotype of a a for any line may be due to additive variance or additive gene action or uh, effect uh, sorry trait uh, value of any genotype is majorly dependent on whether it is uh, controlled by additive gene action or dominant gene action or epistatic gene action so in, uh, in normally we say the additive gene action is very good because uh, those gene action will as the cumulative they as these additive genes will be accumulated in the single lines will have a more yield means it will have a cumulative additive effect the dominant gene action is more so then you go for heterosis that is hybrid development where the you will get more superior uh, superior hybrids if the additive gene action is more for the trait of interest then you go for varietal development where you go for selection uh, selection will be effective so for to calculate this gene action for the tra trait uh, for different traits so in the cross pollinated crop majorly in the cross pollinated crops they have uh, designed different of different type of experiments through such experiments you can go for uh, estimating the gene action uh, of the trait of interest so this gene action can be estimated through as a component of genetic variance or through combining ability variances and effects 
the spe major steps involved in measurement of gene action include selection of genotypes and making of crosses according to different mating designs so you select genotype you go for different crosses uh, in, a, in, a, in a different mating designs and you evaluate the progeny evaluate the material of the parents and also the progeny and you do analysis so based on this analysis you come to the um, conclusion that this trait is having more additive variance and it is controlled by more additive gene action so such, uh, such that is the protocol for estimating gene action so in that estimating gene action there are different uh, mating designs are established so majorly biparental mating designs so in that include north korean mating designs so this uh, design concept is developed by Comstock and Robinson. So here uh, so they, they worked in the uh, North Carolina states of USA. That's why it is called North Carolina, North Carolina mating designs. So here they have proposed three designs where from the F2 population uh, using as a pair from the F2 population and P1, P2 and having some crosses in between these, uh, these, uh, these uh, lines and you derive uh, edit, uh, the trait value, uh, derive the trait, the gene action involved in the trait. So in the North Korean, uh, Carolina design one, so each set is considered uh, of F crosses. Means here in the F2 population, you select some parents as uh, males, that is M1, and you cross with different set of females, that is F1, F2, F3, F4. This M1, this is a male, M1 is crossed with f1 to f4 this m2 this is second male it is crossed with another set of different set of females means each male is crossed with different set of females so this uh, and you form a set uh, this is four males and four females is uh, including a four four different types of process will form a set one like that you have different sets and you analyze the data so so this is the anov for north Korea design one so here each set will consist consisting of f process means the total number of females used in the process is the number of process you attempted in a set one and variance between the male since this male is crossed with different set of females so this male act uh, the progeny derived from this male is all are offsets and you as i said this is controlled by it is uh, offsets uh, analysis will use the data on general communicability and we know that the general combining it is majorly because of additive gene action or additive variance. The specific combining ability is majorly because of dominance variance. So this um, variance due to male will provide the GCA or additive additive variance or provide the estimate of additive genes. Variance among the female. This since these females are different, each cross is a particular for that female. So the variance due to females will provide estimate of both additive and dominant gene actions. So this is the set of uh, design, which is uh, developed by Comstock and Robinson, which is used for, uh, uh, for identifying the additive and dominance variance or the trait, which is uh, you can estimate the gene type of genes, whether the additive genes or dominant gene are, is controlling the trait of interest. Here, you cannot estimate the epistatis. So this is ANOVA, ANOVA for North Carolina design one it is very important here in this ANOVA you should remember this error degrees of freedom so it is always uh, asked uh, either in the objectives or uh, anywhere uh, anywhere so this uh, degrees of freedom for sets is s minus one so replication is into r minus one for male in the sets s into m minus one same female sm into f minus one and the error degrees of freedom is set divided by male into female minus one by r minus one it is very simple uh, in simple ANOVA also for a rare degrees of freedom will be like uh, t minus one into r minus one so here you have a replication minus one r minus one so treatments are male into female that's why and there are different sets are there s yes, into mf minus one so that will give error degrees of freedom so here the variance due to male this is variance due to male will give the estimation of additive, uh, additive variance. The female will give the estimate of additive and dominance variance. So now come to North Carolina, Carolina design two. Here, each set of male will be crossed with uh, all uh, same set of females. Means every male will be crossed with same set of females. So this is the design this is M1 to M6. This uh, each M1 is crossed with F1 to F4. M2 is also crossed with same F1 to F4. 
so here the total crosses in the set is equal to m into f the variance due to male and females provide the estimate of heredity variance because so for this these are all offsets population so the offsets population will estimate the general combining heredity so it will give additive gene action so for f also so this this whole population f1 this the whole lines will become the gca for, you can estimate general combining ability for the f1 so it will give additive gene action the variance due to male into female will provide the estimate of dominant uh, gene actions so this is anova for north corona design one so here the error degrees of freedom is s into that is said into ms minus 1 and r minus 1 so this is very important here male into female the variance due to male and also female will give the estimate of heredity genes and also variance due to male into female the cross between male into female will provide the estimate of dominant genes now come to north corona design 3 here each sector consisting of 2m process means the f from the f2 population you select some lines as males and you cross them with the parents p1 and p2 so this is called north corolina design 3 here variance between male provide estimate of heredity genes because so this um, the males where male is crossed with different set of females because they are all from the opposite population and similarly variance due to male into female provide the estimate of dominant genes this is this particular cross the cross between male into female where you can estimate the variance due to particular cross uh, male into female will give the do dominant gene action so this is ANOVA for North Corona design 3. So here the error degrees of freedom is equal to S for set 2N, where N is for uh, this uh, the number of males and uh, minus 1 and R minus 1. So this is for North Corona design 3. So this is the comparison between three designs of uh, NCD1, NCD2 and NCD3. So here <laughs> these three are designed based on the uh, mating uh, male parents used the mating of each selected male plant to the male parent will be selected from f2 population where in ncd1 they are crossed with different set of females here in the ncd2 same set of say or same group of females in ncd3 it will be crossed to p1 and p2 of the original cross the efficiency if the ncd1 is least powerful this will be intermediate and this is more powerful so population used here f2 and f2 and f2 p1 and p2 here variance is calculated for male and females in ncd2 males females and also male into female here male and male into female area required as this required many process so we can see here here estimate uh, same additive on dominance variance so total crosses are made is total and number of females will gives the total process here male into female the cross between the number of males into female will give total number of crosses here two because p1 p2 is used the two into number of males used will come will get a total number of crosses so maternal effect will be observed here here also here not observed because the p1 p2 parents are used here maternal effect is not observed additive variance is obtained from the male here from male into females and males so dominance variance is obtained from the females in the ncd1 male in, in the particular group that is male into female and male into female okay now comes to triple press cross i am audible Hello. Yes, sir. You are audible. Yes, sir. Okay. So now we will move on to triple test cross. So triple test cross, uh, test cross is a modification of uh, NCD3. So here, uh, crossing the selected plants from the F2 generation uh, with the parents, we will also use cross to F1 hybrids. So that is called triple test cross. So this is most uh, uh, it is also called uh, a superior design for the superior design because it provides the information on epistatis. So this concept is given by Kearse and Jinx. So here the epistatis uh, is measured by this for using this formula L1 plus L2 minus 2 L3 is equal to 0. L1 means mean of the progeny of F2 into P1. The L2 means mean of the progeny F2 into P2. And L3 is mean of the progeny F2 into F1. 
so if this value is zero means uh, after getting this value you, you go for a t test or f test so from that if the value is significant then there is a absence of f status if the value is greater than zero and it is significant then there is a presence of f status in the uh, for the trait of interest so now move on to line crew tester this line crew tester is most popular and it is used in all the a uh, breeding community for uh, estimating uh, for judging the combining ability of uh, like parents and also selecting superior hybrid combinations not only in the uh, normal breeding even in the private sector also especially in the maize improvement permanent improvement the most probably they go for line crew tester analysis because of uh, the suitability of this design and the area required and uh, very simply to adopt this design so this is also called modified form of top cross and it is given by kemp turner so here the male the number of males used as testers and females used as uh, lines so the crossing between these two is called a line to tester here you can use like a, any number of females and males uh, but you should be careful uh, where the error degrees of uh, freedom should be at 12 as any for any anova designs the error degrees of freedom should be 12 so here most of the case so when we go for uh, especially in the cross point to cross it's a very tough job to go for crossing between many to female because they are highly cross pollinated and uh, very difficult so if you have a male sterile lines so then you use male sterile lines as a females and you select the fertile lines as a males so then you go for uh, as a uh, testers so then you go for line to tester analysis so do you estimate the gen, uh, combining ability and the gene action from two variances of combining ability and you can select a particular parent or uh, parent or the hybrid for further cultivar development so here in the line to test suppose you cross with the tester and you, in this process you estimate the gene action majorly through the combining ability if higher gc is there gc variance is significant then the most of the uh, trait tra gene uh, trait is controlled by additive uh, additive gene action if the sp variance is more uh, significant then the trait is controlled by dominant gene action so this is another table for combining ability that is line into tester cross this is replication m minus 1 the error degrees of freedom is r minus 1 into mf minus 1 this r is for replications m for male females so variance due to males and variance due to females so here as I said, the variance due to males, so you can estimate for uh, general combining ability as so. If you males uh, male is used, so then for this male, these are all become the opposites. So when you estimate the variance for the opposites, you can estimate for uh, general combining ability. Uh, if you estimate uh, SEM, if you calculate full sim, so then you will get, get the specific combining ability. So based on this, you uh, select select a line. If you select a line which is having high GCM, so then you go for development of synthetic varieties or open, uh, synthetic varieties or composites. If the line is having higher SEA, then you further test that line uh, with our uh, different uh, high, with our ruling hybrid. If it found superior and it is highly adaptable, then you go for release as a hybrid development. If you are doing this line to test analysis in the initial generations, like uh, in the initial inbred line development, that is early generation, that is S2 generation, S3 generation, then if GCI is coming, so then you take those lines. You, when you go for in inbred development, when you are consider, uh, selfing continuously, you pick those lines for, especially for synthetics or uh, synthetic development, or you, you found that, yes, it is selection for this line is uh, very effective. If the SE is more, then you take that uh, for a hybrid development, especially for the hybrid development so in such way. So when you use a tester for uh, deciding whether the line is having high GCA or high SEM, it should have some traits. So tester should be selected uh, for, to identify a, test, a tester. You should have give some characters, different characters. So one is broad genetic phase. If the tester is having high broad genetic phase, so then it is very easy to judge the inbred line uh, for their, uh, if, the, if it is narrow genetic base means if the tester is for, suppose for uh, some uh, specific uh, conditions like drought condition or it is for salinity, then you use that test, uh, it is a narrow genetic base tester 
so that any analysis you do so it will judge the inbreeds majorly for the particular environment if we use a broad genetic based tester then the inbreeds can be judged for a different environment so, so that is the idea that is wider adaptability if the inbreed is having higher uh, the tester is a wider adaptability so judging the inbreed for a, especially for ac and uh, combining ability is very superior the inbreed uh, the tester should be low yield performance because if the tester is low yield performance so any superior combination which is coming in the f1 in the progeny is majorly because of the line the combining means the line is having high breeding value it is transmitting this superior quality into the progeny so in uh, and because as you know the tester is having lower well lower yield performance it is a low performance for the traits so any superior performance which you observe in the progeny is majorly because of the lines so then you can pick up the those lines for uh, hybrid development so this is the main concept in line into tester so here in the ars examination especially these are asked for five marks and also 10 marks questions so then if you uh, give answers like this means line tester who given this cross and you put the design if it is for five marks you directly write the anova anova is very very important you should learn this anova and you should give what you can derive so the, for the um, variance due to males you get the estimates of G, uh, general communicability females will give estimate of general community and male to female give the estimate of specific communicability so if i gc is there means additive gene action is more and and, and uh, you can uh, and so such lines can be used for synthetics and uh, composite development high se is there then means go for hybrid development and you can write the characteristics of testers so if you give larger details so if, if it is half smart 10 marks then you go for complete information if it is of five marks you simply write line to tester analysis who has given and uh, what are the lines and tester you write the ANOVA and it is more than enough so now come to dialyl cross analysis this is one of the meeting design and it is very tough designs where you may go you should go for large number of classes so that's why uh, it is it is also used earlier so now uh, line to tester is most preferred compared to dialyl cross analysis here mating of selected parents in all possible combinations and analysis of that set of dialyl cross is called dial analysis if you go for both the direct and reciprocal crosses, then it is called full dial analysis. If you go for off, uh, only direct crosses, then it is called off dial analysis. You can see here the crossing plans for uh, a dial cross where excluding reciprocals. If reciprocals are there, then these crosses combinations will be there for P2 and P1 and P1 also P2 then comes to partial dial analysis because this dial uh, complete dial analysis where the number of crosses are more it is very difficult to do such crosses because you, uh, there is a difficulty in, in, in the matching the flowering time and it is drudgery of the labor area so by looking into this this partial dial is another option here what will what we will do we will reduce the number of crosses we will sample the crosses the uh, sample the means process will be made in a sample uh, of the parents so here this sample that is s is uh, for cal calculating a sample of process there are some specification means it should be total number of parents if you divide by two means half of the parent it should be either equal to n by two or more than the n by two and uh, such way so means so the uh, number of process can should be either uh, half of the number of parents used or more than the parents used so this is ANOVA for partial dial analysis for estimating combining ability so this is the error variance r into n s divided by 2 minus 1 this is very important where r is the replication n is for uh, number of parents and sample number of process used in the uh, partial dial analysis so the especially it will uh, gca for male particular uh, P2, the off tiles will give estimate of GCA and the particular cross, if you take, then they give a significance for SCA. So, this is a um, difference between a full dial and a, a off dial analysis. Full dial means where the reciprocal parents are uh, not uh, also used, off dial where reciprocal crosses are uh, not used. So, the total number of crosses in the full dial is n into n minus 1, here n into n minus 1 by 2. 
when the this is used when the reciprocal uh, difference are significant when means when the maternal uh, effect the cytoplasmic effect is also having uh, impact over the trait uh, uh, effect trait value so then you go for uh, full dial even when there is a recipro maternal effect or the cytoplasmic effect is not, not significant then you go for off dial analysis it is used when the male sterility is absent because you cannot go for reciprocal analysis when there is a male sterility so when there is a male sterility present you go for off dial analysis estimation of maternal effect is possible in case of full dial here it is not possible in the, as you know in the full dial both the male and female is used use for mating here either male or female is used for the ma uh, mating so then the comparison between dial and partial dial analysis here total number of process is equal to n into n minus 1 by 2 here nf by 2 the efficiency is for 10 to 12 parent because of the drudgery flowering time matching so labor uh, resource uniformity so if you consider all the errors in the field condition so it is highly uh, efficiency uh, is good uh, if you up to up to 10 to 12 parents up to 20 parents you can go for partial dialysis here sampling is essential in the partial dialysis precision result is more in the dialysis because we are having more number of process results also high higher and um, there are different types of uh, method of analysis in the complete dialysis uh, one is graphical approach and also numerical approach and mating chances of parents as male, male and female is equal here it restricted so and the estimates obtained from the dial analysis is gca sa variance and its effects but here sa effect is not obtained because sa effect is not obtained because here few number of process you will not have complete process few are still the two parents having uh, since the we are uh, we are decreasing the number of process. Some parents will be escaped uh, to having complete uh, full full di full full, full C process. So because of that, you cannot estimate AC effect. And um, here, graphical approach is applicable, not applicable. So coming to Heyman's graphical approach, which is given by Jinx and Heyman. Uh, in the full dial analysis, there are two approaches. One is graphical and one numerical. The graphical approach will give the estimate of, it will not give the estimate of combining ability. So it is used for estimate of gene action, RQ, dominant, and uh, such in, uh, and partial dominance, forward dominance. So th this data can be generated from AMN graphical approach. There are different uh, uh, components are there, uh, calculations are there. So those calculations will be applied and uh, the VR and WR graph will be estimated. And the position of regression line on the VR and WR graph provides the information about average degree of dominance. The inference are drawn depending on the position of the regression line. So you take the, you develop a VR and WR graph and the, you, you get a regression line. If the regression line stretching into the mm, origin, then it is complete dominance. If it is over, above the uh, line uh, regression line with the uh, origin then it is partial dominance that is passes above the origin cutting vr axis then it is partial dominance if it is uh, touching the limiting parabola then there is a lack of dominance if it is below the origin then it is called over dominance and also that uh, different um, position of parental points along with regression lines indicates the dominance order of the parents if they are near to the origin if the parental points the parental trait values come near to the origin then they, are, they, are, they carry more dominant genes. If they are away from the origin, so then the more if they carry more recessive genes. So intermediate position, they, there is an equal frequency of dominant and recessive values. So looking into the, uh, the graph, uh, VR and WR graph, you can decide the trait as whether it is trait as having uh, dominance, over dominance and partial dominance. If the trait is having complete and over dominance, you go for hybrid development. If there is no do dominance and no partial dominance, then you go for like varietal synthetic development. And if the parents, especially parents which are uh, placed near to the origin, they carry more dominant genes and, do and those parental lines are superior and you go for, uh, so you pick those uh, parents for hybrid development. Then Griffith numerical approach. So this approach is, uh, uh, it is uh, mainly based uh, one, uh, there are four methods in this. It is mainly based on uh, well, uh, using F1 and when you use for uh, identify the, when you use uh, for analysis, whether it is F1 is also used, parent also used, reciprocal process also, also used. 
based on this there are four methods in the method one f1 parents and also recipe classes used and in method two only f1 and parents are used in method three recipe classes used in the method four only f1s are used so here error degrees of freedom is r minus one into t minus one so in this day analysis you go for in this uh, graphical uh, graphic numerical approach the effect uh, the estimates of additive and dominance variance will be estimated based on the combining ability analysis so here through component uh, component of variance mean additive variance dominant variance is uh, mainly estimated from the data from the data which uh, numerical uh, uh, the data points through calculation of the parents f1 so from component variance you will estimate this one so g estimation of gene uh, ratios is possible here here not possible inclusion of parents in the analysis is essential here not essential so identification of superior cross combination is not possible in the hemin approach but in the griffith approach the cross combinations can be uh, estimated so this uh, this is uh, a traditional uh, uh, quantitative you know, the biometrical different analysis we used uh, in the estimation of quantitative traits uh, to decipher the where whether this control by dt gene action dominant gene action to identify the parents especially for development of hybrids and variety development so now come to dna ma marker just i will rush through this this i have added uh, simply because as you know so now we uh, we have advanced so people are going for markers means we know that quantitative traits controlled by many genes so suppose it is controlled by 10 genes in that so one uh, gene one may be having higher effect if all the 10 genes are giving a uh, total adding the additive effect of all the 10 genes will give a 100% phenotypic variance of a trait of interest maybe gene one may be having 20% um, uh, effect for the tra trait improvement gene two may be having 5% effect for the trait improvement gene three may be having 15% means the among this point in the quantity in the minor genes each individual genes may be may be have their uh, different additive effects so in such uh, such cases the dna markers will uh, will be very important to identify the re, um, allele or the genomic regions in the plant uh, regions where which harbors the different alleles of the quantitative traits and in that uh, region if you identify a major cutel means the genomic region which can gives more than 10% of the phenotypic variance so such uh, cutels will be very useful in the breeding program you can pick those genomic region and usually marker assisted by cross breeding or genomic selection or marker assisted recurrence selection in such programs and those can be those cutel region means quantitative traits can be improved in a normal in, in the uh, self pollinated crops also so here different types of dna marker non pcr based markers that is rflp pcr based markers include rpd ssr sps snp and ssr so these ssr markers are highly breeder friendly markers uh, which are used so currently now the snp markers are replacing this ssr markers so these markers why uh, it is highly useful because as i said in the initial uh, when the quantitative traits are identified because the continuous variation for traits are discovered the so people were uh, were in the uh, confusion whether they are they follow mendelian inheritance or what so this through molecular markers you can clearly explain the mendelian inheritance of a quantitative traits these genes we inherit uh, they follow law of segregation the law of uh, the law, law of segregation inheritance of what mendel suggested but they are affected by environment and they are controlled by many genes so so these uh, molecular markers can be used for measurement of genetic diversity you can go for uh, uh, diversity analysis because phenotypically diversity analysis uh, may be uh, uh, may be different in the molecular level you can go for higher level of diversity analysis suppose phenotypically two parents uh, one may be uh, medium height another may be tall parent but genotypically uh, maybe because another parent is tall maybe because of environmental effect so it may get uh, higher nutrients some sampling error or error in the field conditions so if you go for genotypical analysis you can clearly get the difference between the two parents you can go for pin finger um, painting 
so where in the varietal registrations you can go for varietal fingerprinting and uh, gene genotypic pyramiding marker access selection indirect selection using uh, quantitative trait loci and so these are all uh, different applications of molecular markers so in the molecular markers there are two types codominant markers and dominant markers codominant markers are the markers where you can differentiate between f1 and the parent lines this is p1 so this is uh, this p here you can differentiate between p1 p2 and also f1 f1 will have the both the bands of the p1 and p2 but in case of dominant markers you cannot differentiate between f1 and the parent lines this p it show you so it the f1 may be looking similar to p1 or it may be looking similar to p2 so it is very difficult to distinguish between f1 and the parent lines in case of dominant marker it is very useful in case of codominant markers so codominant markers are highly used in the uh, mapping of uh, quantitative traits and also in the uh, molecular breeding programs in order to map the quantitative traits you uh, you should develop uh, so initially you should develop a mapping operation through using the principles of linkage analysis so then you will map uh, uh, you develop a linkage map and uh, then you go for phenotyping and also you So, genotyping the mapping population, and you will identify the point QTL regions. So, for that, uh, different type of mapping populations are there. So, what are mapping populations? So, population which that is suitable for linkage mapping of the genetic markers is known as mapping population. So, mapping populations are generated by crossing two or more genetically diverse lines and handling the progeny in the uh, definite uh, fashion. So, for uh, so. this linkage maps is more important for mapping the or identifying the qtl regions or uh, mapping qtl quantitative trait loci so for construction of linkage map we you need a suitable marker system either ssr or snp rapd rfep and you should have appropriate mapping population and the software for proper data analysis so different mapping populations include Uh, recombinant inbred line yeah, uh, f2 population f2 derived f3 population recombinant inbred line population backcross populations then builds backcross inbred line population near isogenic line chromosome substitution so these are biparental mapping population so here the first thing in the parental lines you should observe parent should be diverse for the trait of interest and if it is desirable if they are diverse for many traits so that you can map different traits in a single population and you will get more diversity for the uh, markers when you uh, analyze for the both the parents so p1 it is if you want to map for disease resistance so parent a will be highly resistant parent when parent will be highly susceptible so then you get the population then the traits uh, the progeny will segregate for the resistant susceptible so then it will uh, through uh, the application of uh, markers So molecular markers you can go for mapping of those traits so these are different type of uh, as i said this is a haplide double haplides also mapping population f2 you will go for crossing in the f2 and then continuously you self it and you generate uh, uh, advanced intercross populations real some best suitable mapping population a biparental uh, population for um, mapping this recombinant inbred line population so because this real population are um, Uh, can be used in a multi location studies they are immortal so so that any since phenotypic is a very important trait which can be affected by many environmental factors so real populations are immortal in nature you can go for a multi location testing multi year testing those for, uh, for, for phenotyping so that's why reals are very best uh, suitable population for mapping studies so but here there are in the biparental population This, this is resistant this is susceptible parent means you are targeting only two alleles two alleles of a trait of interest but uh, the, as i said there are um, different parent lines will be there suppose this is a parent a if it is resistant for blast maybe for race 1 um, and there are different races of bla blast uh, pathogens will be there so it is resistant for patho type 1 so another parent may be the parent e a c which may be resistant to patho type 2 so you are not cap mapping the or you are not capturing the allele of patho uh, parent c the resistant gene c which is resistant against patho type c so in such conditions you go for multi parent crossing means you can cross between um, 
more number of more than two parents and you generate a matching population so in that case so one is matching population that is multi parent advanced generation intercross population these are collection of trees produced from a cross of complex populations so here there are eight parents are used a b c d e f g s so they are crossed between the a and b c and d e and f to generate f1 these f1 are again crossed to generate another uh, a f1 having a b c uh, four parental lines these four parental f1 will be crossed to generate the recombinant inbred lines which are mosaics for different chromosomes regions of a all the eight parental lines so these reels carries all the alleles of these eight parents so when you go for mapping of this you are capturing more alleles means suppose this is a resistant for pathotype 1 c for pathotype 2 d for pathotype 3 so then so when you go for mapping in the magic population you are going to identify the tutel regions which are resistant to different uh, resistant genes so that this is the advantage of multi um, uh, parent population so second type of uh, multi parent population is nested association mapping population here combine the advantages of both linkage mapping and association mapping strategies here single parent line it is called as founder line it is crossed with different uh, around 25 different lines and you continuously sell these lines to develop a real population real population here this uh, b97 uh, it, it is the common parent sorry b73 is a common parent these are 25 lines so these 25 lines are crossed with this uh, uh, 73 line and you continue to sell to develop a real population so this is called nested association type of population so you are capturing values uh, from the 25 different lines here so then comes to tutel mapping so here so now you selected a mapping population suppose ril so then you extract the dna and first you go for uh, parental the uh, scoring so in the parental scoring you identify different uh, polymorphic markers in the parents initially you go for polymorphic survey in the parents p1 p2 you identify the markers which are polymorphic between parents and then those polymorph suppose you run around the 1000 markers between the parents you may get around 80 to 90 polymorphic markers those polymorphic markers you run in the mapping population that is called genotyping so then using a software you develop a a uh, linkage map in the real population so this is for real, uh, linkage mapping you go for uh, phenotyping this real population in the multi location and then you go using uh, software like qtl api mapping qtl cartographer you identify the qtl so very simple way to uh, tell the qtl mapping is single marker analysis so here you group the genotypes based on the marker suppose this is the marker e you group the genotypes into the different groups a and b here also for marker h you are grouping into a e and b so now you go for significant uh, uh, test the difference between the uh, these marker genotype for the phenotypes if they are re really uh, apply t simple t test if this group of genotype is significant for the trait uh, for the phenotypic trait then this marker e is associated with qtl qtl so here uh, if both are non the marker group and the phenotypic traits are non significant so then it is not associated with the qtl this is simple single marker analysis Li linkage map is uh, this is this is the simple example of linkage map so where as i said so you genotype the population and you generate linkage map linkage map is necessary when we want to go for composite interval mapping is to identify the flanking markers so here you genotype uh, this um, chromosome this is wheat chromosome 5a 5b 5d so these are the markers this is the linkage map so this region indicate qtl region so here the marker uh, 07 the qtl is located between 070 and 037 then you use this marker for uh, interrogation uh, interrogation into the susceptible parent or to uh, through marker assessment backcross breeding this is simple technique of marker assessment backcross breeding here the donor parent is there recipient parent is there you have a polymorphic marker for foreground selection foreground selection is nothing but selecting for the trait of interest so here you see xa13 is a blast resistance uh, race uh, gene uh, for uh, blast so this is p1 uh, maybe resistant parent this is susceptible parent so anything um, um, using this markers see these are the progenies 
if uh, these are the progenies here you will identify the plants which are positive for the xa13 so this is called for one selection so you cross with donor f1 you will get again you cross with uh, recipients you get bc1 f1 here you apply for for one selection select the plants which are having resistant gene of interest through marker which is linked to resistant gene and then you go for background selection background selection is nothing but the genomic regions uh, regions which are um, similar to recipient parent so then so that what will uh, what will happen so the genotype which is having maximum genotype of uh, recipient parent and the, the resistant gene from the donor parent will be selected and it will be again used for crossing with the recipient parent so again you generate bc2 f2 so like this within two to three generation in the bc3 generation you will develop a improved line of a recipient parent which is carrying the resistant genes this is a graphical approach which is showing the background background selection in the bc2 f3 generations you can see the red color may be from the recipient region the blue color is the donor region where it may it is having the rate of interest so remaining this white color is maybe unknown which is not uh, from uh, captured in the marker region so you select the lines which is having more you know, recipient parent genome and the um, marker rate of marker which is associated with rate of interest and you go for background selection so this will into marker extra background screening so uh, this from this i am completing my uh, lecture actually this is very tough and broad, uh, broad topic uh, and uh, time even be was very short so many things i even i have left generation mean analysis these are all th simple things you can read out so my suggestions for uh, here as is so as you know objective uh, for objective exams there are many number of objective books are there you can follow it it is very uh, very simple for attending uh, those things uh, especially for net for rare as complete rare as exams you should go for books and you prepare your own notes for that okay so you take book, different books you prepare your own your own notes and you prepare for like five marks questions answer for every topic in the book in the especially you will get maximum questions from the plant breeding and also quantitative genetics and from genet then from genetics then from molecular marker part and a few questions from cytogenetics so what you have to do each and every topic you make your own notes in the points wise where if that if, uh, if line into tester it is given for five mass questions how much i have to write for 10 mass question what points i should write so like that you should make notes so thus those your own notes will going to help you in a better way those books are there shortcut books are there but they will not help you uh, in much of uh, much way to clear crack the exam if you know the concept you can write very well so best books for me is this jr sharma the principles and plan practices of plant breeding jr sharma is very very beautiful book where you will get you will get a breeding concept in a different point of view than the bd sing so then go for bd sing plant breeding these two books are very very nice for especially for the plant breeding so then you know for genetics there is a bd sing book is there for quantitative genetics there are two books are there one dablukar and faulkner any of punan singh book is very important because in the punan singh book you will get points wise points wise you take the points from the punan singh book means for exam point of view for depicting the answer punan singh book is there but there are many things which are left over from the punan singh or you can get it from double current partner you, you pick those uh, points from the double current partner and make your own notes so other than this the, for marker part you go for ak singh and bd singh and uh, for charan goshal book is also important especially for disease resistant part so with this thank you sir ah uh, sir how can we avail the jr sharma book actually so that is not all where i have search but ha uh, it is not available any. you get it you should get from seniors okay sir uh anybody is having you get it zorox it it is not no the... sir nobody is having here okay <laughs> i also got from my seniors but really that is very very beautiful book yeah i have heard about that book but anyhow i am trying from 2 months or 3 months but not getting it okay
so you uh, see because na the way breeding is explained na folklore yes, uh, quantitative genetics way the breeding is explained na- through quantitative principles yes sir uh, that's why first you read there uh, see when you make points i tell you first you read bdc you will get simple concepts yes sir you read, read jr sharma so by reading bdc same concept in jr sharma you make points okay yes, so then some points may be missing in the bdc some may be there in the jr sharma so that will be combined see in the ars is a written examination the questions are yes, common sir. to you you will also read bd singh i will also read bd singh so then who yes, will get good marks who yes. who make extra different points na so you will get good marks so for that reason you should put such points it should differentiate you from some other person yes sir so then the the uh, the evaluator will see yes this person has written very well compared to this person so then you will get very good marks Uh, thank you sir i have it but here i am in jansi where i don't uh, get it garab san send you if possible you would send me address i may i may do that okay sir hmm. okay thank you sir for how to contact with you sir so i will give my number you take it okay sir 810598 810598 Three eight two three zero two three zero. Okay, sir. I will WhatsApp you on this number. When will you free? Hmm. So you, you call me any time, not issue. Okay, sir. Thank you Especially for after office hours. Okay, okay. After six uh, p.m. Okay. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so I repeat number eight one zero five nine three eight two three zero. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Any questions? Any doubts? <laughs>